Good morning, everyone. Kia ora tato. Welcome to this um, annual plan council meeting. Welcome to uh, councillors, welcome to the staff, to whom we are indebted for the collation of all the submissions, uh, to the public, media, and most of all, to the submitters. They're the important people in this. Um, we have one apology from uh, Councillor Pete for today. I'll move to the Chair that that apology be accepted. Second to Councillor Staines. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Yes, carried it. Carried it. Uh, confirmation of the agenda. I'll move to the Chair that the agenda as um, published be um, confirmed. Second to Councillor Staines. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Yes, carried it. Um, number three is for noting. Um, Number four actually isn't here, but I'm going to move from the chair the suspension of the standing order requiring people to stand when asking questions. So, uh, second councillor Staines, is there any discussion on that? I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carry. Right, um, just a little, I'll just do a little introduction. Um, as we're aware, after council's uh, deliberations in January, we issued the draft annual plan and sought feedback from the community on all of the issues and spending suggestions in that draft annual plan. And we specifically identified three for particular consideration by the community. Uh, and that appears, I'd have to say, to have been successful as we've had um, a record, at least in recent years, of 1,119 submissions, of which um, 176 will be heard in person, I think is that the number. So I think that's great. Um, council uh, put up the draft plan in, uh, in good faith, and um, we generally want to hear the community's views on it. Now, however, because of such a large number of submissions, the time allowed for these hearings may be quite tight. Um, that is a considerable number to get through, um, and we need to give everyone who wants to be heard uh, the full chance um, to do so, and we don't want to be rushing the last ones or extending uh, into evenings when we will inevitably be uh, already tired and possibly scratchy. So I intend necessarily to be pretty strict with the limits on times for speakers. Um, that's a discipline I ask um, of the submitters, five minutes for individuals and 10 minutes for organisations. I also think we need to discipline ourselves I would ask the councillors that we councillors restrict ourselves to essential questions to elicit extra information or clarity um, and don't stray into discussion or argument. Um, that's appropriate during deliberations next week. We'll get plenty of time to do that. Um, and can we avoid repetition? There are a lot of repeat um, submissions, so if questions have been asked and answered for some, we don't need to necessarily ask them of others. Um, or indeed, if another councillor has asked a question, uh, we don't need to repeat it. Um, so, on to the submissions and poll position is Mr. Friedlander. Welcome, George. Thank you. Can we get someone to. There's a terrible feedback here. Yeah, feedback. Could we please get someone up from this to. Sure. Well, it's. By the end of the night, we will be does, touchy. Does anyone have any idea of what's causing it? Me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Councillor Vanders. Um, George. Thank you. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. Um, the floor is yours. You have um, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. <coughs> Bearing in mind the, the time frame we just mentioned, we, I think our application is pretty much spec for itself. Um, you know, on behalf of Olsen, we obviously thank for the support over the years. Um, last year, we forgo a lot of our application. Obviously, money was tight. Um, and this year, I guess that, that our funding has been reinstated. We are asking for that money that we didn't get last year to get that on top of to help with some uh, marketing initiatives, really. I, I think you know, it's been pretty tough out there in the tourism portion of the market. And I've been taking a fair share of hits, and we are struggling, I guess, to promote ourselves. So, uh, if you look at the budget towards the end, we really, the extra money we're looking for, which is not a significant amount, is really aimed at promoting the house. So, 
sorry, promoting the house to uh, the local market, but also the national market. Um, and for example, we've never been able to send our manager to Trends in Auckland. And uh, whilst we have representatives who speak on behalf of Wallace, we prefer to do it ourselves directly to the wholesale. So that's the nuts and bolts of it, really. Um, I don't really have anything to add other than that, unless you have any questions. Well, I'll throw it over to questions, councillors. Does anyone have any questions? It was a very clear um, written submission, I have to say. Thank you for that. Uh, any questions? Yes. Councillor Thompson. Um, you, you say that your, your wholesale admission rates have been frozen at the request of the tourism operators. Not, how, how long has that been the case? Uh, we, we, with the wholesale, we have to set our prices two years out. Right. So we're stuck. I think uh, we have negotiated. Well, we are negotiating a small increase for 2017, yeah. as we speak. That's as far out as we can go. And a good example of that was we got caught out a few years ago with the GST increase, and they would not uh, put our prices up in GST. And that is an example of how frozen they are. We just had to wear the that was GST went to 15%. Um, it's pretty tough with those guys. We have no power. Councillor Hall. Outside of admissions to the House, I'm aware that you're running a number of initiatives around um, admissions to the grounds, uh, particularly trying to get uh, local admissions up. And I wonder whether it's too, is it too soon to tell whether those uh, casual admissions to the grounds are translating into paid admissions to the house? And, and if it is too soon, then um, kind of, I'm assuming that data, is, is that data being collected or? Uh, probably Jeremy can that better than I can, but um, we don't charge for admission to the grounds, but obviously by getting people into the grounds, we hope they'll then go into the house. Um, and I think we, we do keep pretty good records of where people come from. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the local people visiting has probably tripled mm. since we've started those initial initiatives. Mm. Councillor Noon. Thank you, Worship. I'm just looking on page 18 of our uh, papers, but it's under your um, financial statement year ending 30 June. And I just wondered, could you comment on accounting fees, and it's got the Lynn City Council in brackets, 2012-15K, 15 and a half for 2013. Could you just elaborate on that? Uh, yes, so because Alveston is owned and trust by the city, all our accounting function goes through the DCC uh, you know, our funding done, uh, is held by Treasury. We don't run our own bank account. All the wages and everything goes through the city um, and we pay for that. So that's effectively an internal charge yes. to the organisation. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Uh, thank you. Two questions. One quick. Um, how do your entry fees compare to other similar properties around the country? Uh, well, we've, it's a good question. Where uh, we don't really have any real data on that. We are we try to keep it as reasonable. Because I'm part of our deed is to make it as accessible as possible. So we're mindful of that and, and what the market will bear. Um, I, I think we're comparable, if not cheaper. The, the one issue, I guess that we always have, and you all have heard it in here many times, is we're competing with organisations in the city which are free, uh, when we accept that. That's that was my follow-up question. I noticed uh, you're um, 1850 for adults and 1450 for residents, yeah. which I think is great. Do you think, like Toyota being free and things like that, and the city providing a lot of free visitor services, uh, really competes with you and takes visitor time away? It's a, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, I think it makes the need an attractive place to come. You know, people have a good time here. We can go to the city and see the art gallery and you know the toy tour and those things for free, and they'll do other things while they're here. So it's an attraction. But yes, it's, if people have budgetary constraints, there's only so much they can do. But more on, on top of that, uh, when Alveston started back in the 60s, there weren't many attractions in Dunedin. Now you have space. You've got Cadbury's, there's all sorts of things which are paid. There's still more people coming, so I don't think it, personally, I don't think it's a, a major issue. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you, George. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, the next submitter is Bernadette Newlands.
Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Newland. Thank you. Um, Mayor Cull and councillors, thank you for the opportunity to talk today um, around the issue of the Portobello sequence of the road widening and the cycleway. Um, I'm speaking to you really as an educator who's worked on the peninsula now for nearly 30 years. In fact, in the last 30 years, I think there's only two and a half years when I haven't been either teaching at Portobello School, principal at Broad Bay School or principal at McAndrew Bay School. And I'm currently the principal at McAndrew Bay School. Um, and I'm also a resident of Broad Bay, so a real peninsula person. Um, what I would like to talk to you about is really the experience I've had um, in terms of the difference that the cycleway, the walkway, has made at McAndrew Bay School over the recent years, and also thinking back um, to my times at Broad Bay and at Portobello and the issues that really face families getting their children safely to school without the benefit of foot, safe footpaths and um, the walkway that we currently have, being such an asset at McAndrew Bay. Um, as you can imagine, the time that people are getting their children to school is the busiest time on the road. It's when all the, the uh, people are going into work, so the road's really, really busy. So it's very important that, um, that the children can get to school safely. Currently, people think it's too unsafe, usually, to walk their children, so walking is less of an option um, in Broad Bay and Portobello. So they tend to drop their children at the school gate, which um, most of you will be aware causes a huge amount of chaos. You've got cars everywhere, people double parking, it's not particularly safe. Um, in, in my time as principal at, at Broad Bay, we had a number of accidents that luckily were people backing into other people's cars, not into other people's children. Um, so they're the sort of issues that you want to avoid by having more people walking. Also, um, we have, and I know Broad Bay also tried to get a walking school bus. Now that was something when I first came to McAndrew Bay when we didn't have the walkway, we tried to do for the people from Company Bay to come along to school. And it was really deemed to be very unsafe by the, by the um, police education officer when they looked into it in the DCC. So that had to be left. Although we did have enough footpaths to get the children along from Collinswood, we couldn't do it from um, Company Bay. But now we have sometimes up to 30 children walking in a walking school bus along from Company Bay to school, which is just fabulous. Um, another thing that I think is really important in terms of the benefits I see for the McAndrew Bay community are really in terms of health and wellbeing and community connectivity. I see um, the community are out and about, they're bumping into each other, they're having chats, the kids are biking or scootering, the parents are walking or biking alongside them, and it's just a great way for the community to connect. Older people in the community are out for a walk um, after nine o'clock when things are a bit quieter. It, there are huge benefits to all sectors of the community. So my plea would be to stick with the current plan, don't change your sequence, stick with what you had decided earlier, I think back in 2005. Um, I think that people further along the peninsula have got less footpaths even than McAndrew Bay. Um, so it's, it's really important that we deliver what we thought was going to happen, if possible. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Uh, thank you. Uh, just the first question is, do you think that people, uh, being a Broadway person yourself, would you be prepared to pay more to, um, there's a few submissions that suggest that just doing all of work quicker, um, but it's a matter of how that would then be packaged. Do you think the people who benefit most from this, being people like yourselves, would be prepared to pay more as a targeted rate to get that to happen? Well, well, I certainly would, but I mean, I'm a principal and on a reasonably good salary, so I can't speak for my whole community, but to me, it would be a, you know, a, a huge priority and I certainly would personally be prepared to pay. And the second question, I may ask several people this, but if you look at, as we did, we, Mike and I went down the, um, had a look at the project last week, and if you think about Vauxhall being a very narrow part, and in one of the submissions, the suggestion that seven hectares of soil has to be moved in to do that whole project, which is a lot of truck movements. Mm. What will happen to that area as the truck, if, if your project is done first, if, if your sections, as you suggest, are done first, what it will do to that with a large number more trucks going down to... Mm. Um, and I just want to understand that 
Are you very are you very familiar with the box hall section and what it's and how many people use it now, and how many school people want to use that section as well? Well, I, cer the trucks? I certainly drive past. You know, as we commute into town or come into town for various things, we see people using the box hall section. I guess in terms of the trucks um, and the impact on the road. You know, we understand that, we've been through that with the McAndrew Bay section, we've seen all the amount of fill that comes and we've seen the trucks and we've experienced the, you know, the, just the problems of, of waiting and all of those sorts of things. But I think in the end you have to go through that, don't you, to get to somewhere good. Yeah, but you, you, if we did the boxer section first, it would be safer for the other trucks to keep on going further out. Councillor Wilson, yeah, but, yeah, is that a right. question? No, it is. It's, it's, I'm just wondering if, if she understood that part of my question. Um, okay, so you're thinking about the damage to the road, etc. No, are you? No, I'm you thinking? thinking about the increased truck movement that will be, if we did the Portobello section first, the increased truck, truck movement on an already narrow section. <coughs> is, had you considered? I hadn't yeah. considered that. Okay, thanks. Councillor Benson, Park. Thank you. Um, you talk about the vehicle congestion at those peak times at the beginning and end of each day. Yeah. Yeah. That's a common problem with all schools, particularly yeah. primary schools, isn't it? it uh, is. is there any difference for the peninsula schools in that respect? Well, I think particularly at Broad Bay School, you know, there, they've got little Roebuck Rise, which is incredibly narrow, and Greg Street, which is also very narrow. So I think. That's, that's a particular area which is quite difficult. Um, Portobello School has got that car park, but it's got a very dangerous cutting there too. So there are, there are a few issues for both of those schools that I would see. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. In, the, in Broad Bay, the, the access to Broad Bay School, um, there is... Sorry, I'm, I'm just looking at maps here. I'm not mm. actually reading my emails or something. But there's... Um, uh, for, for the majority of Broad Bay, there is access to the school without having to go along Portobello Road. But I guess what you may not be aware of, you know, there are footpaths. So if you're walking up Greg Street to come to Broad Bay School, you're walking on the road. That, that street has got a little blind corner, a bit of a bend, and we always found that incredibly dangerous. In fact, since I've left the school, I know they've put in road bumps because they needed to slow down the traffic because of the fact of those children walking to school on the road, along with cars using the road. <coughs> yeah. Councillor McTash. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, the, the question that I have is similar to Councillor Thompson's, and that is, even if there was that footpath there, students would still need to walk up Greg Street to get to school, would they not? They would, they, they would, or unless they came from the other way, which is even worse, because Roebuck Rise is, um, you know, it's got a terrible bend at the top there, you can probably see on your maps yeah. if you're looking at that. Um, but that, that would be a shorter section, at least the majority of their trip to school would be safer. Right, okay, thank you. Any further questions? Thank you very much for your submission. Thank you. Now, uh, Mr. Simpson. <coughs> Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Ian Simpson. Um, I run uh, the Logic Studio, a local web development company. Um, this is Ruben Scapa who runs Swift Social, um, again a local company, uh, dealing with social media, that sort of thing. Um, we've both had the opportunity to bring interns into our businesses because of the 67 job program. Um, we've both employed an intern um, and we both hope to employ another in the, in the near future. Uh, this has allowed both of us to grow our respective businesses um, and uh, it just wouldn't have been possible for us to do that without the support of this program. Um, so firstly, I want to say thanks for the support the Council has given to the program in the past. Um, we're here today on behalf of the whole Dunedin business community, um, not just the IT sector, um, seeking an increase in funding for the program to allow more businesses to take on more interns and more sectors. Um, I'd love to answer, I'll do my best to answer any questions that you've got. Thank you. Questions, councillors? 
Councillor Carroll. I'm reading here that the estimated dollar value that businesses gained from having an intern was, I think, $63,000 or something. If the businesses generally feel that it's got a huge benefit to them and there's an ability to do things, why would the businesses not be paying for that if they see the value in it? I guess, I mean, I can't speak for every business. Um, there is a, a large risk element, so while it's an average of 63,000, um, some will be lower, some, some will be higher. Um, and there's also obviously quite possibly a large lead time on that. Um, for example, I was talking to um, somebody recently who's taken somebody on in a research and development role. Um, obviously, when you are effectively starting the business, funds can be quite tight. Um, and I think that for him, their research and development will have a big payoff in the future. Um, but that might be a year or two down the track. So a small investment now, um, from both himself and the, and the council, um, will hopefully pay dividends and create jobs and businesses down the track. Would that work at all to be a loan? Um, and I guess the difficulty is, again, that it's not a guaranteed payoff. Um, you know, we also know that research and development sometimes uh, it comes up that this isn't going to work, um, so it may work. Um, yeah, I, I would be cautious in that making the companies that it doesn't work. You know, if it doesn't work out, if you have to pay that, pay that money back, then that's, yeah, it creates a different situation. From my perspective, we took on um, someone without revenue board. So we were hoping that they would be the ones who would generate that revenue that has been that way. So it allowed us to take a risk without knowing, without the resource to pay them over any long term and, and go, okay, let's hope we can grow this business to enough revenue to support this person long term. And so that has happened for us. So if that happened for the businesses it happened for, do you think they'd have any appetite for saying, well, <coughs> it's worked for us, so we're prepared to pay back for it? Um, again, I can't speak for every business, but it, it could well be a possibility amongst some of them. Um, I think for us it was about reducing the risk of that employment situation. Because as you know, there's a, there's a lot of risk in, in employing someone. Just after the risk. Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, it, financially, the, the gain isn't huge. We're talking $1,500. You know, that's not a lot, really, when you're employing someone for any time. Um, but it actually gets you in the door with them, and then you okay, yeah, this person is going to be a generator for this business. Um, so I think the loan thing, whether <coughs> that wouldn't be an issue really. I don't think that's not what general, why people really like it. It's not about the money. It's about the <laughs> risk. risk <laughs> it just gets, it's an incentive. That's what it is. Councillor Hawkins. Thank you. Um, this program in your submission says it grew out of, as a response to a shortage, a skills shortage in the IT sector locally. Um, I'm assuming, but correct me if I'm wrong, that the kinds of employees that have been taken on by businesses through this program are weighted towards the entry level end of the IT employee spectrum. I just wonder, has this, what is, has this made any real headway in addressing that broader skills shortage problem? In, that se in the sector locally? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, the majority of the people coming into the program are, um, are entry level uh, because they're students mm. um, or recent, recently graduated students. Um, and keep in mind, this is across many sectors, not just IT, um, although some of between a third and a half are in IT. Um, I guess it, it has, has helped us um, in that. Hopefully, there should be more people staying in Dunedin um, in the IT sector. Um, for example, uh, one of the guys, or the guy I have employed, um, he uh, it's only got a fixed term role, unfortunately, because he did plans um, for later this year. Um, but certainly, in that time between, he was he was planning on heading back to his um, folks' place in Canterbury. Um, so, I mean, that's eight months or so of of employee time that has stayed in the city um, and obviously if we had 
we'll put them down and we want to them to find somebody else. Um, so yes, it does help. Because um, every little, every, every new student that studies in the city will, after a couple of years, mean that somebody experiences hope based on the city. And can I just ask, between the, uh, the contribution of the program and the contribution of the employers combined, what, how does that stack up compared to the market um, salary for the people that are being employed by this internship program? It's not dictated by anyone. Um, we don't say you, know, you have to pay them for straight career. Um, it is suggested that we pay them a, a, um, a fair salary, a fair wage um, during that time. So um, we certainly pay several dollars more than minimum wage. Um, but less than you would pay them if you just employed them. About the same as we, okay. we would pay a, an entry level person. Um, so, you know. I would say it's quite a reasonable, uh, a reasonable wage. Councillor Watt, do you think giving these students an opportunity to do business in Dunedin and be part of a business in Dunedin have a, has a greater chance of bringing these students back at a later time to start a business in Dunedin? Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's not the ideal situation, I guess, is that um, yeah, they stay here or they come back here. Um, you may have seen the article on the ODT and I think on Channel 3 the other the other day about Dunedin being the Silicon Valley of the South or um, whatever the term they coined was. So um, I mean fostering that sort of, of um, uh, environment I guess is always positive. Um, and certainly I mean they, they mentioned um, Pocket Smith which was created by the students um, timely and thank you payroll but there's also a, a bundle of other smaller um, startups who are, who are doing pretty cool things, um, and if we can keep those people in the need, and that's always positive. Uh, the company I'm in is a startup, and I work um, with startups as well in another job. And I think there is a real culture of working within startups, which is slightly different to a, or quite a lot different to a mature, more mature company. And so our interns actually are being exposed to what it means to be in something which has to be very flexible and pivot very fast if things are changing. Um, so I think just that experience is good for, for those guys and is likely to drive that, uh, the likelihood of them being part of startups in the future. Councillor McTatch. Thank you. Thank you guys for your submission. The question that I have, I don't know how long you've been involved in the programme so you may not be able to answer it. Um, but that is, if I look at the number of interns or the, uh, the jobs that have come out of the internships every year and look at the proportion of those, it seems to be a bit of a case of diminishing returns and that um, 2019 was the highest, it's about 66% of those um, doing the internships um, resulting in, in jobs. Um, we, we're down to about just over 30% this year. Do you think that that is um, something that we a trend that we'll continue to see and or is it something that's related to the fact that um, businesses that have used this in the past perhaps for their low-hanging fruit are now using it for um, riskier areas or um, and the third question out of that is if that is the case ought it be restricted to a one-off thing for businesses so every year it's a new batch of businesses. I think I mean, one of the factors is certainly early on it was just IT. Um, so I, I can't tell you which which year it became um, opened up, but that could be a factor. Well, obviously there was quite high demand in the IT sector. Um, so uh, I'm guessing that's part of it. Um, it's also worth pointing out too that these aren't final figures. Obviously there's still um, internships happening. Um, or finish which may be our job later this year. So we expect that number to rise to um, around about 20. I think we're sitting at 17 jobs created now um, as of last week and we expect it to be somewhere around 20. So pushing towards that 50% mark, um, which should, should be a better, is a better result already than last year. Um, so in terms of um, the companies using it um, and the jobs that they're they're, um, they're using it for, I think, uh, a lot of the companies who used the program in the early years have, have stopped using it. Um, and that could be to do with, um, obviously, you know, 
they can reinvest the money that they've got from the first ones into the, into the future ones. Um, so yeah, there was a couple of companies that were, I'm not going to say prolific, but they certainly used to poke for the first few years that haven't for the last couple. Um, so I guess you know, it could be because of the mix of companies that are doing it. Um, more startups, which I guess are, is riskier um, in such different, different sectors. No further questions? Thank you very much for your submission. Thank you. Mr. Polanski. <coughs> and Mr. McLaughlin, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I appreciate that it wasn't really necessary, but we feel we should make ourselves available to answer any questions councillors may have and to add emphasis to the value we place on the support we receive from the Dunedin City Council. I would like to say to you all that we appreciate the support and assistance of both the governance and management sides of the Council, and in the latter, we especially welcome the ready willingness of Rhonda Abercrombie in City Property and Rebecca Williams in her team. The hall has been operating in the railway station since 1999, and in that time has established itself as a national memory house for all that has been achieved in New Zealand sport. And this is increasingly acknowledged throughout New Zealand. People achieve great things on sporting stages throughout the world, whatever the sport may be, but it is in Dunedin that their deeds are remembered and perpetuated. When we first set up shop in the railway station, there were discussions with city officials at the time of developing the Anzac Square, Lower High Street, Lower Stewart Street area as a heritage precinct. The Settlers Museum, the Cenotaph, the law courts, the old prison, the old police station were all in there. It seemed a natural evolutionary step for the present to re redevelop its past. We're pleased to know that this is slowly coming to pass and that we're proud to be part of it. At that time, we even suggested that Lower Stewart Street could be renamed Yvette Williams Way in honour of the Dunedin woman who became the first New Zealand woman to win an Olympic gold medal and also set a world record. But we were told that might run into opposition and we backed off, knowing that Yvette would not have wanted battles fought in her name. But the thought still remains. We don't just run what is in effect a sports museum. We continue to liaise with people who have been inducted and our most recent were two of the most celebrated sports people in their time, Sarah Ulmer and Jonah Lomu. Our inductions continue to form part of the annual Hellberg Awards dinner and this gains national television coverage. This year the Hall of Fame segment was accompanied by specially shot footage of the Hall's interior and the exterior of the station. We continue to publish books that commercial publishers would not worry about, and this year we'll, we will be mounting a special display to mark the deaths and action of two of our honoured members, Anthony Wilding and David Gallagher. We're pleased to be able to tell you that we have received specific funding for this from a special fund set up by the Lottery Grants Board. A cursory examination of the Hall's accounts show that we operate under a tight financial regime, and that any money we do receive is expended in fulfilling the Hall's objectives. The DCC's grant is made to assist with rent and insurance and its provision frees up money to spend on furthering the Hall's aims and providing more exhibits. The Dunedin City Council's support is critical to the continued well-being of the Hall and a continuation of that support will be greatly appreciated. So thank you and we'll take any questions. Thank you. Questions, Councillors? Councillor Van. Um, are the sources of income that you have, are they... Uh, Sort of fairly consistent. Um, have you got any um, potential to expand or do other things, or perhaps even to some extent reinvent yourself, as all uh, businesses and museums and whatever must do from time to time? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, just wondering, yes. how do you see looking into the future? How do you see your ability to perhaps expand or or uh, broaden? The of what it is you do. Okay, well, that's, <coughs> thank you for that question. Um, our other main funding comes from Spark, so that's 100000 a year. Uh, and then we have one off grants that we're able to get through the Gaming Trust. Uh, we have our admissions, which are about 28000 a year, that's revenue that comes through. And then, uh, apart from that, we get, uh, we've got members who pay a subscription. Right. So, in terms of reinventing ourselves. 
sorry, do you get any community trust or other other kind of grants from time to time, or do you apply for them? Yes, we do. Um, we find for capital type items we can attract funding readily, right. but for operationally that's where the issue. <coughs> yeah. So we've had very good support because when we first set up, we uh, were able to do so with capital grants from the various trusts. But in terms of reinventing ourselves, this is um, on the agenda regularly, just looking at how we can relate to the public. And being in Dunedin, we also look at our outreach to the rest of the country, and we look at satellites where we can um, <coughs> add value to other parts of the country so that they know that it's not just Dunedin, we're actually a national museum, but certainly anchored well and truly in Dunedin. Is, is there any potential for you to road show or to exchange uh, with other um, museums around there? Yes, there is. And, and has any of that sort of happened so far? Is that something you're looking at? It's something that we're looking at. But once again, they're all in the same situation of funding, so it, it may not be a, a, a revenue source. Thank you. If I could just elaborate, <coughs> just to explain the, the first part of your question was about reinventing ourselves. Up until this year we've been restricted because we've been a New Zealand Sports Hall of Fame and therefore we can only have displays and exhibits on people who have been inducted following a review process. At our annual meeting this year we got through a change that we are now called, or can be called, New Zealand Sports Hall of Fame and Museum. So, which allows us to have exhibits and other things on people who have not been inducted or on sports events like the Commonwealth Games in Christchurch, for example, or the Paralympics. Or, or, or even items, you know, items, famous cricket bats, carousel yeah, exactly. seats, anything that's like that. That sort of thing. We're, and we've already begun doing that. Okay, great. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Just wondering, uh, and taking that point further with the museums, and in the past few years we've ensured or encouraged museums in Dunedin, which there are a large number of them, to collaborate um, substantially more than they used to. Um, some of those were done by putting grants through the actual museums, like Strathtari getting it straight from Toy Toy. I'm not suggesting that in this case, but what collaboration are you doing with other museums in Dunedin to ensure that your point of difference isn't overlapped by others, but also to make sure that you're working most effectively on collaboration on marketing, for example. The, the collaboration, Councillor Wilson, is, is just by personal contact. I'm in regular contact with people at Toitu in particular, mm -hmm. um, and was in regular contact with Shroom Paul at the mm -hmm. Otago Museum. Haven't had contact yet with the, the new director, um, but it's at that level that um, they're aware of what we do. Um, just and, and you know, if I have a conservation problem, for example, I will bring the appropriate person in, in the museum. But as far as marketing your museum, you do that completely se separately. Yeah. When the, uh, is it potential to collaborate better on those sort of things? It would need investigation. Um, I'm, I don't know. Uh, it would certainly help in terms of money. Mm. Um, I, I just don't, I can't answer that question. Thank you. It's, it's certainly worth exploring. Though. Councillor Hawkins. Thank you. Does the New Zealand Sports Hall of Fame have a view on the potential for the railway station to become a node for uh, intercity bus passengers and or cruise ship shuttle passengers uh, during uh, the cruise ship season? Well, I think it would be uh, positive if we had more people coming down there other than the toilets, I suppose. The <laughs> as long as there are more toilets provided, <laughs> that's always an issue, isn't it? A lot of people coming up. But look, uh, any traffic that's coming through would be positive. Thank you very much for your submission. Um, Mr. Brown. Michael Brown. Welcome. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning, Councillor and, and uh, Councillors and everyone else present. My name is Mark and Brown. I'm the General Manager of, of Basketball Otago. And I have with me Simon Eddy and Marie Taylor Cyphers, both are 
from the board um, and Simon helps out with our commercial relationships and Marie with legal um, advice as well as helping us with our junior programs. So once again, uh, we're, we're here this morning to talk about our application for a civic grant to help support us with the court hire for the Oceana Gold Nuggets home games. Um, this is an arrangement we have with the Edgar Centre who are the main um, suppliers of our court space for all of our programs from the elite right down to the youth. So yeah, thank you again for your support in past years. Um, it's been vital as far as keeping us going and we strongly believe um, in the importance of the elite programs um, and helping us support the whole triangle with the big wide base, which is right down to the youth. So thank you very much. It's, it's been uh, vital as far as keeping us um, going and being able to have such a great influence on the, on the youth. Um, a good example of that is our, is our player coach, uh, Mark Tickle, Dunedin homegrown talent, and doing a fantastic job sort of running our elite programs right down to our youth. A great example of that is the basketball school, which he initiated a couple of years ago in the mornings, and it really helped to provide for the high school students, which are a very tough sort of group to keep going in, in activity and sport, and the results he's getting with them are just fantastic. He's having over 100 uh, some mornings, and he's got a registered base of you know, 120, 130 young high school uh, players from all the different sort of high schools around in Eden and they're just producing great results. We've had some national championships recently and improved results across the board for them. So thank you again and if you've got any questions we're happy to answer them. Sure. Councillor Thompson. Um, Mark, I'm just wanting to understand a little bit of the budget that you've got here because you've, I, you've, you've got uh, the revenue in there from the DCC, um, which is yet to be approved, but uh, the, the the door takings, what do you charge for people to come to Nuggets games? We charge, um, we've actually had to put our prices up uh, since uh, previous years, we charge $17 for an adult, $12 for a student and 7 for a child, and we have a family pass um, at $35. The reason I ask is that, that um, $30,000 for gate taking seems to me an extraordinarily low figure given you're, you're getting crowds to those home games of well over 1,000 people, up to 1,500 <coughs> people. So I'm struggling to see where that figure comes from. Yes, well, basically we have quite a large commitment of tickets that go out to our sponsors um, and different funders and community groups that help us out as well. Um, we also look after a large sort of volunteer base so a lot of the crowd is actually there on a sponsor's ticket or on a complimentary ticket. Um, and we're working on obviously trying to fill it up with the, with the paying public. And traditionally we have sort of a bit of a slow start at the start of the year and we've been lucky with some good results that the crowd numbers have driven up as the season goes on. But yeah, that basically, it's not a huge um, money spinner for us, I guess, the gate. I guess we are... Um, quite heavily reliant on, on a few other income sources as well. So what were your gate takings in the 13, well you're still in the 13, 14 year, but what what are your gate takings in this year? So far we're, we're tracking along just on budget and I believe we will be getting around the $40,000 mark for, for, the, for the year. We've got an extra gate this year. If I could just quantify that, the uh, ticket prices uh, were increased on average 50% this year, and that's because we received a lot of feedback that ticket prices were very low in the marketplace for a sporting event of, of that calibre. Um, so we did a study of other NBL teams who raised ticket prices to what is the market average across the country uh, for similar organisations. What that's meant is that we are uh, on target for this year's budget in terms of uh, revenue incoming, but also with some spare capacity in the stadium, uh, we do have the ability to hopefully exceed income expectations in that area. So it's, for us, it's about, I suppose, taking a more commercial approach um, this year, and we believe that come the end of the year that will reflect in the gate as well. All right, thank you. 
Councillor Wilson. I, I just wanted to um, tease out your submission, which talks about a hundred thousand dollar court spend, but your actual application talks about forty five thousand in the budget. Now here you're mixing two activities. Is that correct? One is the application. Is this one's about nuggets only? Yes. But your submission refers to basketball or target generally. Yes. Well, as I said, it is an integrated thing. We we don't uh, look at. The nuggets, is, 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 we do obviously treat them separately in many respects, but I guess we do feel there's a really positive influence on the wider basketball scene. So when we look at all of the competitions use um, and the development training, so the, the practices for the for the youth, that is where it, it supports the Edgar Centre with a, a very large spend. Uh, and I think you know all of our competitions are, are growing, so I think there's been a positive growth thing for basketball as far as our numbers go. And, it is helping you be centre. Okay. And the, um, this is a handout which you didn't speak to, but just your middle graph, the growth in player participation across genders of all ages. I'm just checking that. So this year, or the 2013 year, if I looked at just that figure for the secondary schools, you were saying there are almost 120 new players in this year. That's actually uh, team, team numbers, Marie. Sorry, is, it, it growth means that these are all new. It, or is it that's the total number of teams? So the graph is indicating the increase. And so, are you asking for the secondary schools between 2012 and 2013? Yeah, it looks like there's 120 new players. Is that correct? Is that how I read that graph, or is it? No, it's, no, it's grown so, up. Yeah, sorry. So there's 100, that would be teams. And so there's 100, you can see just over, I think it was about 112, 109, I think, teams in 2012, and then there's it must be about 119. Okay. 119. Sorry, sorry, I was taking the growth in player numbers um, as being the graph heading to mean that that was the growth. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, well yeah. Yes, yeah. So obviously teams are consisting of players. So yeah, no, that's fine. I, it, it, it's not a growth chart. Yeah. Councillor Noon. Thank you, Worship. Um, my question is probably for Markham. The total income, just looking on your, uh, your budget, is 460 odd. Roughly half of that is sponsorship, and I just wondered how much of that sponsorship, and I don't want to know the details, but how much of that sponsorship <clears throat> is short term and long term, short term being on a yearly basis, and um, what is the balance that's effectively tied up for two plus years? Yes, yeah, so I can add to that, and I, I can answer that, sorry, and I think Simon will probably add to it from a commercial perspective, but yeah, we do, we are working on um, longer term relationships rather than just being a year-by-year -year proposition and Simon can probably add to that his impact. Historically predominantly BBO's done its um, sponsorship across the organisation on an annual basis and it's a commercial realisation that that's a laborious time consuming thing when you're revisiting the same people year and year again. So this year there was a much greater focus on signing two, three and five year sponsors. Uh, on average we've uh, converted probably around 25 to 30 percent of our sponsor base to multiple year sponsorships and certainly that's a trend that um, we intend to continue in signing people up for the longer term because it means we can have more sustainable relationships and continuity of income. Thank you. Councillor Cowell. Just a brief follow up on Richard's question, on Councillor Thompson's question. Um, have you considered discounts for people rather than free tickets in the sense that instead of having half of them paying an amount which you've increased this year or whatever proportion it is, saying instead of the adult $17 ticket we'll let you have it for 10 or whatever, is that, I mean because that would make a huge difference if there's a lot of them and still be people who, who you're wanting to be nice to and, and say thank you for your help but they would still be in a better position. I can probably answer that, having run the cutter on the commercial arrangements for this year. We do have a contracted number of tickets, which are part of sponsorship arrangements, which are unavoidable, and they're long-standing. When we were setting ticket prices for this year and bringing them to market level, we were aware that um, that could result in some challenges which were unforeseen. So, uh, on one hand, we were trying to establish a ticket price which was market average, but we do have special offers and promotions for particular games around community groups. So we have particular organisations that we offer discounted tickets to. Some are sponsors, some are 
uh, wider parts of the community. And we also have various promotions where we do things like bring a, buy an adult ticket and bring a child for free. So it was more about not devaluing your product, but at the same time maximising participation and accessibility. If that answers your question. Not totally. Um, it seems to me that one of the things you could do, I mean, you've got an arrangement saying you get whatever it is as a result of whatever. You could presumably say to some of those people, ch change those things a bit and say to some of those, would you accept not having 20 free tickets for the games or something but paying so much for the ticket? I mean, it, we, we you received can go back and up. And uh, of course, all of our sponsorships are commercial negotiations and um, we receive a weekly review of the <coughs> utilisation of tickets that have been issued to sponsors or gate sales in terms of what's been issued and what's actually gone through the gate. The uptake of the tickets that we are contractually obliged to provide to sponsors are usually in the 90-95% region and not many of our sponsors would be willing to relinquish any of their comp tickets because they're just a long-standing part of any commercial relationship and I think that's probably largely across the board with any sporting team. We're not a sponsor. We're not, we're not a sponsor? Um, the DCC, sorry. Yes. Uh, well, we, you're a community funding group, so yeah, there. Yeah. So you're, agno oh, you're, agno you're acknowledged as a funder and, and not a sponsor. Right. So, so those people aren't part of that. Right. Councillor Hawkins. Thank you. I have uh, a couple of questions about access also from a slightly different perspective. If one of the reasons that we're funding the Nuggets is as a, an inspiring thing for our young people in the developmental side of, of your business, how are you managing um, the access to those games for those young people? Because we can sit around and talk about how, how ticket costs are too low all day, but that's still going to be too much for, um, I'm assuming, some of the developmental players that you're targeting, how are you balancing that with your commercial market level box office model? Yes, well basically we, uh, obviously our child prices are, are not probably exorbitant, so there's all, all children up until the age of high school age can come in for a child ticket, so it's, it's fe fairly accessible. How, how much is that, sorry? Uh, $7, okay. but as Simon said earlier, we've run some things like uh, an adult can bring a child free as well, so that, that's been quite a good um, policy or, or a good measure for us to take in the past as well and we've used that to some success so and occasionally we will get a team to maybe help with the clean up afterwards so we'll provide them with a complimentary ticket or we use some of them for floor sweepers uh, so we use quite a lot of uh, the different young development players for different roles as well as giving them good access to tickets. Sorry, can I just add to that? Please do. I've coached uh, the children's manual for the last three years and Fairly regularly I've been given through at the school uh, where I coach free tickets for children so generally I can give out a player of the day will get a free ticket to the game or a couple of tickets and I've noticed that it's really the parents will come along if the children get a free ticket generally the whole family comes along and it's actually a really effective way of encouraging the kids to play then they come to the Nuggets and it's all really exciting and the family gets involved and the sibling might come along after and start playing so that's been quite an effective thing that I've noticed that we've done. And I think just further that it's, it's worth noting that um, the NBL standard across the country for a family ticket, because basketball is largely a family game, our experience is that parents have children that are involved and it goes full cycle, so there's a big emphasis on parents bringing their kids who are participants. We're one of a very uh, small number of teams where the family ticket is three children. Um, we, a lot of the research that we had found that people were buying family tickets which were two adults and two children and then buying an additional child ticket. Um, so we allow three children as part of our family ticket which increases accessibility as well. And just looking, oh, the, the stuff, that, I mean the basketball stuff sounds great and the Edgar Centre stuff sounds great but again, I mean there are costs associated with that. I mean, as basketball in Otago and I know it's, I mean it's, it is relevant but um, happy with the facilities available in the community that are available for young basketball players, developmental players that they don't have to pay to use? Yes, well, we are you know, really thrilled with the facility that is the Edgar Centre. It's an amazing indoor facility and a lot of teams that come down here are just from other regions and that's even Auckland and Wellington, you know, comment on how lucky we are to have such a 
accessible space uh, right in the middle of town, basically, and great car parking and access and things like that. So we're really pleased with that. We've also uh, taken, over the past couple of years, that high school programme that we have run um, has been open to the, um, the participants at no cost. Um, so we, we've, we've targeted funding groups to help us try and cover the cost of the court hire and some of the costs associated with that. But it's helped, you know, get that access up. That's great, thank you. Councillor McTavish. Thank you. Just one question, and that's um, the development uh, lot, you have a development line item here in terms of your expenses, which is court fit or court hire. Is that also at the Edgar Centre? Yes. Do you have funding that comes in that is specifically tagged to that, or does it not make any difference to you whether we tag funding to your Nuggets court hire or to your development court hire? Yes, well, the, um, the funding that that the DCC has provided has gone specifically to the court hire by way of a credit with the Edia Centre. But we do um, obviously have other costs with the development and they're not in there, probably the competition costs. So yeah, we look at local funders to help us with that community trust uh, in other charity. I, 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 I understand that, but I guess what I'm trying to ascertain is whether um, if there was greater support around this table for supporting development rather than supporting nugget court hire fees, whether that makes a difference to your bottom line or whether you could just as easily find another funder um, that would that you could apply funds for, for the nuggets from. Yes. Well, uh, I guess we're fairly consistently hitting you know, targets with other funders. Uh, well, not when I say fairly consistently, it's trended down. Uh, over the last few years, but we've obviously, you know, we try and maximise our funding opportunities as much as we can, and they're shrinking rather than growing. So there isn't another funder we could we could find to, you know, cover the gap um, if if we lost some of our funding. Uh, so, but you know, it, it does help wherever it goes. I guess it's it's in the um, pot to help with court hire. Uh, so, so it really helps, and I think, yeah, it's hard to find in this day and age more funding out there. It's, it's going out, it's trending the other way. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. <laughs> are, are your corporate sponsors locked in already for next year, or is that, is that speculative at this point? Uh, I haven't actually got a copy of the budget in front of me uh, to refer to. We've got uh, Bartercard down here at 25000 and corporate sponsorship 210000 Right, OK. Uh, but on the basis that the, the forecast is similar to this year's, this year's numbers, then, then yes. Bartercard's a bit of a funny beast. It's, it's, it's funny money, but in terms of our commercial commitment for the coming year, um, as I think I alluded to, I think we've probably signed in excess of 30% of our current sponsors, and we don't see any of them going anywhere at this point. And, and the other question is, you guys have got a really professional organisation and you've come from a, a situation where you were just about out the back door a few years ago to a situation where you probably a case study for how a number of other sports should do things. But the, the City Council's been there through the tough times to enable you to get to that. What's your plan? to wean yourself off City Council help? Because there are other people being told no, and were told no last year when you got told yes. So you understand the difficulty we face, and that's why I ask about the gate charges. I accept you've got to build a, a business. It seems to me you're doing that very well, and um, I wonder if you have a plan where you could take those gate takings to that next step and wean yourself off. Is that, a, is that an aim? Indeed it is, and the BBO board uh, meets outside of normal session at the moment for an additional meeting once a month to talk about our one, two and three year strategy, and key to that is um, reliance on commercial funding and sponsorship as opposed to grants. And um, it's great, wonderful to hear that you recognise the BBO has gone from here to here. Um, as I'm sure everyone in the room knows, it's often the last 10%, which is the, the hardest push. Um, we've recently had a um, 
fairly substantial change in board members and we feel that we've got a very, very good uh, range of skills around the table at the moment that are working together very, very well to facilitate that move. And uh, an indication of that is that at present we are talking to a number of large national firms about long-term sponsorship that I would say is probably in its you know, final sort of closing months of getting across the line. These are relatively big deals that don't happen overnight, but it is paramount to us to rely on commercial sponsorship for the nuggets and uh, to, as you say, wean ourselves off of reliance on community grants. Thank you very much for your submission. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Mr Weatherall. Saddle Hill Community Board, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Um, for those that um, are not familiar, I'd like to introduce uh, our Deputy Chair, uh, Pam Dimmer. Uh, we'll share the presentation if we can today. The reality is we haven't changed our presentation or our submission from the draft annual plan because we didn't want to make anything harder than you guys than, than the work that you've already got at hand. Um, not in our submission, but I just want to note, because it's quite topical, is around the Freedom Camping Challenges or issues or the trial that the Dunedin City Council is currently operating. Um, <clears throat> obviously we've got a, a trial site being the Ocean View Camping Ground um, that's uh, underway out, out there and, and it's been really successful. The reality is it's probably too successful, I would think, from the initial trial submission that or the plan that the Dunedin City Council put into place. What I would say is that the majority of people are really, really supportive of the trial, the trial and the concept in our community. There's a couple of people that aren't, for sure, and it's, you're never going to get 100% satisfaction, I think, in, especially in local government. But the majority of people are really supportive. What I would say is, though, if the Dunedin City Council are committed to this, then they need to put the resource into that. Um, the, obviously the Parks and Rec staff are, are somewhat limited to all, all the work that they're currently doing. It's just another thing that they've got to manage. So maybe that's something that we, we should look at. Um, we put the signs up and we put the concept in there and, and then there was, that's where it sort of stopped. And, and that's where I think our community board have picked up in a pretty positive sort of consultative manner. But it's us gone door knocking to the immediate neighbours and say, what's your opinion? Because that hasn't happened to date, and that's a concern. But we've, we've done some of that consultation, we've fed it back through a Richard and Lisa to, to ensure that there's you know, a two-way process, and, and that's... Um, footpaths. Uh, yeah, footpaths and curbing. The council and the board have received a number of complaints about the lack of footpaths um, by res from residents in the area, so we are concerned that, that um, there is a gap there. We appreciate the work of Michael Harrison that he's been doing in Brighton recently in terms of getting improvements there. So I just want to acknowledge that. And we're also grateful for the walkway from Green Island to Waldronville. But the remaining areas remain on footpaths and there's nowhere for people to safely get off the road when the traffic um, comes. So we'd like to see that as a priority. We feel that it's quite dangerous. And Overall, our priority in the area is to get most of our built-up areas with footpaths, so that's what we're seeking long-term, but short-term we'd like to see some of those high-traffic areas with footpaths to, to provide a safety um, escape from traffic, really. Um, the Brighton Domain, the reality is it's still status quo from when we chatted at the draft annual plan. We've got uh, local people that are committed to supporting us in kind, so that's fantastic, and, and some reasonable sized companies that are in behind it. Um, from the, the parks team, we've committed to complete the project at Walton Park, which there's some funding available, so once we get that project done, the communication and interaction we've had with the parks team is that, and that, that then will move on to the Brighton domain. But there is, we're going into another winter, we've had a reasonable amount of rain, and uh, the reality is that that ground won't be sustainable for the whole of the winter. That's of concern. Back to roading. Um, we appreciate the challenges that Council face and, and do acknowledge the improvements that have already been made on the road, such as Scroggs Hill. 
But safety issues are still intensified by the lack of seal on a lot of our roads in the area, particularly, in, for example, McMaster Road, Chain Hills Road, Green Island Bush Roads. We'd like to request that the council allocate funds in 2016 and for onward sealing of our roads in our area and would um, prefer that the funding for this be reinstated as early as we can. We continue to identify this need in the community plan and will continue to support requests from our residents. We do not acknowledge the fact that a lot of our residents are, re rely on rainwater and with the dust and stuff off the roads that's also a concern in terms of the quality of their water. And uh, the top of the issue again is, is Saddle Hill and the reality is that our community board are thankful for the Dunning City Council and the huge amount of work um, that's gone into the environmental court um, decision outcome but there is no outcome because it's been challenged again and, and we've got no final outcome today and, and I know that I'm sure uh, the councillors share that frustration with us. Uh, the quarrying continues. Yes, it doesn't modify the, the skyline, but it does continue in there, and I understand you know, the consent is, or the, the discussion is still there. But we would ask the Dunedin City Council to stop all quarrying, or at least um, work with the Environmental Court, with the provider, that we actually protect what we've got. We've lost a huge amount, but can we just plead that actually we stop all quarrying there altogether? In conclusion, um, obviously we're, we're more than happy to answer any questions, but we do thank you as, uh, as the leaders of this uh, city, this community, um, for the work that you are doing. You've got a huge job and uh, rest sure we are thankful. Um, and also with the staff that we're working with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis as well. Thank you. Councillor Tash. Thank you. Thank you both for coming in. Um, just on the freedom camping issue, uh, in terms of parks and reserves, I hear you about the consultation. Is there anything else that you feel needs to be, be needs to be done in order to support that trial, which currently isn't being done, that you would like to see done? Just the management of it, I think, Councillor, because uh, the reality is the signs go up, and that's it. Um, so there's no management of how many campers are coming there, and on a regular basis, we're seeing you know above 20 campers. Um, <clears throat> not so much in the last probably two or three weeks. But the signs say five or five, but we're still seeing 14, you know, on a, on a pretty regular basis. So mm, something's gone wrong there, you know. Mm. And uh, yeah, we're, we're pretty trusting of people, but the reality is it's, it's ab over and above what we've told the community, what we've advertised in the brochures, um, but it's just not, not mm. being managed, I guess. Mm. So y you feel that there's a need for a, basically a regular presence that is checking yeah. yeah, I understand the security company are doing some statistics, but they close the gate, they go past at 8 o'clock, but there's a huge amount of campers that are coming in after 8 o'clock. Okay. Um, so it's that, that, that period there, you know, that um, the statistics that I guess the council are keeping versus what's actually happening, I, I think there is a wee, wee bit of greyness there. Yeah, okay, alright. And in terms of the um, Brighton Domain, I don't know if you've seen the staff comment, but that is that they would they have um, included in a review of sport improvements for sports fields. Um, staff will continue to work with the board to identify areas that can be improved with voluntary input from the community. Uh, what I sense, so is what you're saying is that um, there is there is a need for a plan, an, an overall plan first before the volunteers will commit to input, is that right? Yeah, that's right. I haven't seen that staff comment, so yeah. that's new. Thank you for that. Um, so we, we've, we've, we've supplied, as the community board, supplied a huge amount of, um, I guess, ideas, concepts about how we can put a plan together. Um, but acknowledging also that, that they've said, hey, let's just, can we just do one project at a time? And because Walton Park sort of jumped the Brighton Domain because there was some funds to come available from the tree felling project. And, and there's a need to, I guess, s spend that money first. So, so we're working with you know, the, t the team for sure. Just acknowledging we're going into winter now, that work hasn't been done for another year yet. And, and all I would say, maintenance of the, the drainage system out there is, is one of our leading concerns. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Uh, just in relation to Saddle Hill, I, and I may have picked up on the innuendo in your comment, are you wanting us to ensure 
that any contracts that we have for quarried material do not come out of Saddle Hill? I would be disappointed that the Nain City Council have contracts mm -hmm. with metal coming out of that. If, if the Dunning City Council were saying no more quarrying, don't modify our skyline, I'd be really disappointed to hear that we're getting metal coming out of there to use for council contracts. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that our contracts require or actually go into that, but I, it's an interesting point that you make. Thank you. Councillor Hawker. Uh, thank you. Uh, great to hear that you went door-to-door uh, -door canvassing people in the area around the freedom camping issue. I mean, I applaud you for taking active steps there. Um, I wonder if such an approach wasn't considered around the issue of extending the provision of curbside recycling in the uh, community board area, which you know, is a, a, that's a far smaller and far easier group to canvas, I would imagine. Yep, so that, that contact was done through the council, through um, Ian Featherston, and my understanding is it was really, really successful, uh, positive feedback from a survey that was uh, carried out and that, that <coughs> has been extended as the best model. I guess my question is what other issues, if any, do, are you using that approach to canvas the opinions of your community, aside from the freedom camping issue? I guess <clears throat> we, we picked that up as a direct consultation because we felt it was a really topical um, concern and that we were getting effectively feedback coming through back through the, the public media that we hadn't been privy to. Um, so when, when the ODT reporter rang me and said, uh, I've, I've had five people ring up and complain about the freedom campaign noise, well, well I only know of one, well as our community board only know of one, and the best of my knowledge that any city council have only had one official complaint about it from one person, multiple complaints from one person, um, then it's like, oh, we're, we're, missing, we're missing the mark here, you know, so we're, we're going to have to go and do some um, catch up with people. And is the community board against quarrying and mining more broadly or just in Saddle Hill? I guess the question is, is it a question of ethics or aesthetics that's behind that opposition? There's huge significance with Saddle Hill, as, as anybody in New Zealand, as well as the Needham, would know, because, because how it come about. Um, I know it's a top issue for the Moscow Torah community board as well. Um, are we against quarrying? Um, our board haven't discussed that. We are against quarrying at the Settle Hill site, though. Thank you. Councillor Nunn. Thank you, Worship. Uh, thank you for the submission, uh, Scott and Pam. My question's around the Brighton domain, and it follows on from Councillor McTavish <coughs> redrainage and the, and the basic maintenance that should be occurring. You've been coming in telling us this story for two, three years at least. And I understand there's two parts with CapEx, which is the long term, but maintenance. So can you advise us what has been done by way of maintenance in the last two or three years, you know, when you've brought this issue to us? Are we doing what we should be doing with regards to maintenance on the broad domain? Um, there, there was some basic maintenance improvements done about three or four years ago, but the reality is there's still a number of areas on that domain that that um, absorb or continue to pull a lot of water. So that would be of concern, given especially the environment that we're, we're based out, out there. So one would suspect that the maintenance is not being done satisfactorily. The reality is I'm not a groundsman. I, I don't understand that all, but, and I have to take the staff's um, you know, ex, uh, expert opinion on that. But, but as an observer with unqualified eye, I, I would suggest that we're not doing something because that water continues to pull and that ground continues to be in an unplayable condition. You continue to come and tell us. Thank you. Councillor Vanders. Um, thank you very much for your um, kind comments regarding Mike Harrison's efforts. It's nice to see that you noted those. Um, regarding the, the footpaths and the ability to actually get off the road when there's traffic coming, I understand there's quite a few roads that have quite a deep channel immediately off the shoulder and there is nowhere to go. Um, given that there just isn't the money to fully form footpaths, would an interim measure where at least an area that isn't a formed footpath, but an area where people could step off the road be made available at, moment, at least on say one side? Would that be something that you would support? We certainly would support anything that, gets, that provides an opportunity for people to, to have a space to walk in, in relative safety. 
the, the area from Green Island to Waltonville is, a, is an example of that, where it, well, it's not a formed footpath, but it's formed as an area that people can... can so there walk. is an escape route, is what you're mm, saying? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, re regarding the Freedom Campers, um, I can certainly concur every time, and I, I go out right now fairly regularly, um, every evening there's always been at least 10 uh, campers that w when I've seen them there. Um, and the trial was supposed to be for, for five. Given that it's a fairly large camping ground and there's a good set of fairly new toilets there and given also that the local shops must do reasonably well out of it, would you be amenable to, um, uh, you know, after the trial, raising the, the, the number to say 10 or perhaps 15 if, if the <coughs> local community felt that, that, that it could handle that kind of volume? Obviously the demand is there. I'm just wondering how we would be able to balance that demand with any of the pressures that you feel are on that area. So can you give us an idea of, of, of what you think would be a reasonable uh, level of demand that that area could meet? Sure. So I think the reality is that um, in the number of trials leading up to this formalised trial, or a number of recordings, we constantly seen from the Kaikoura Estuary to Torrey Mouth approximately 17 to 18 campers on the majority of summer nights. So we already knew that there was a huge volume greater than five, you know, so it's about ensuring that we don't set ourselves up for failure, I think. But what we've seen is rather than, you know, two at the Kaikoura Estuary, two blah, 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 all the way down to Torrey Mouth, is they've come into this constantly area, which is what we've, what we've asked people to do effectively, because that's where the facilities are. Even the chap who's made a number of complaints to the council is not against Freedom Camping. He's not against the camping facility being there. It's just about the management of that. Um, so I think with some good consultation, communication with the community, for sure I think the number could be raised from five. Alternatively, the, the, council, or the community board are happy to work with the council and staff about potential alternative sites or additional sites to the Ocean View site as well. So what sort of management would be required to say, manage a, a, a summer peak of 15 perhaps? I mean, is that something that you think is, is reasonable if it was properly managed? Um, I wouldn't want to put a figure on it, Councillor, because, uh, yeah, I think with, with some communication with the, na uh, the nearby neighbours, who are the directly affected neighbours, I think we could come up with a, an agreeable number. And, and with additional to that, I think, identify an additional site as well. Okay. And my last question is regarding the Saddle Hill Quarry contracts. Uh, were you uh, aware that a lot of the Saddle Hill Quarry actually went into the Mamana Airport uh, for the DCC and also for the recent addition to the State Highway 88 Stadium bypass? So you're aware that there's been a history of DCC taking a lot of the material from Saddle Hill. Given that the, that is the cheapest source of chip, and given that you know, we're really under quite a, a, a lot of pressure to actually find uh, the cheapest supplies of things, how, how would you prefer to see DCC policy organised? Would you prefer to say DCC simply won't book, buy from Saddle Hill, even if they are considerably cheaper? And if so, doesn't that just simply load costs onto the DCC when a lot of other no, users and contractors will go to Saddle Hill anyway because they're cheapest. I mean, is there a solution that you can see for us in this difficult situation? Yeah, sure. And I acknowledge the, the money versus, um, I guess, the value that the community places on Saddle Hill. And the reality is that there's huge value placed on Saddle Hill and, and we're getting uh, weekly approaches, as I know that the, the council generally are, as well as the Mosgill uh, Torrey Community Board are, around effectively, let's, let's not do any more damage to the Saddle Hill that's already been done. You know, there's some uh, attempted protection of the skyline and I know that there's a, you know, the, the outcome of the environmental court was, let's, let's not do any more damage than what's already been done. So at, at a minimum, would, would continue to plead that that is the status quo there. So you think that if the DCC doesn't take any gravel from Saddle Hill and they, we decide as a policy that we're just not going to do that, you think that that will actually have a positive effect or do you think that other contractors will just go and get it there anyway? 
I, I don't know. I'm, again, I'm not in the construction business, so yeah. Thank you. Councillor <coughs> Kelvin. Just further to that quarrying thing, and Lee's got councillor, <coughs> this has got half the way. Um, the other alternative appears to be <coughs> the positive effect of taking the hill off the, the rest of the hill off the top and signal hill at the bottom of that where the other quarrying happens. It's not just cheaper on Saddle Hill, but if it wasn't used, <coughs> the other option becomes, I think, understand a monopoly, which means that not only is it currently more expensive, but it has the ability to be a lot more expensive if we didn't have any on Saddle Hill. Would the community be bearing that in mind that it's, that's a reasonable sort of likelihood? Would the protection of the skyline be the significantly most important thing and you could live with still using it if it wasn't a skyline issue? I think that we that, it, that it's a landmark in the in the area. So I think we're really concerned about the loss of the landmark. It's something that Captain Cop identified as um, something that everybody could see. By losing Saddle Hill, we're, we're kind of losing something. I think if if, if I could sort of put the analogy, it's kind of like mining in the national parks. It's, it's like we want to protect something. It's, I'm sorry, that doesn't quite answer your question, but I think it's an emotional issue for people within the city area as well as just the, our community board. Councillor Lord. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Scott, my question was uh, in relation to the fact that we've got no ceiling budget at the moment and you've made a request here for at least four different roads. Are they in the priority? written in the submission that you would like to see them sealed in? Uh, like is it Scroggs Hill Road, Camp Performer, Masters, Chain Hills and Green Island Bush Roads or? Yes, they are in our priority. That's in the order you'd like yeah. to see them done. And, and that still is represented in our, um, in our annual plan, which we continue to, to work with the transportation team on. Yep, right. thank you. Thank you very much for your submission. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Feather. Miles Gill, Tari Community Board, welcome. Good morning to the councillors. Thank you. My business this morning is, uh, it will be short. Um, I'm here in support of the Tari Facilities Trust. And, uh, respect to the council granting it, it's uh, $30,000. <coughs> what I'd like to see is the, what I'd like to see is the um, proposal that, that was put in the draft plan uh, turned into a reality. And um, the interest in the community and the way in which the community has embraced uh, this challenge uh, is, is something to behold. Um, the board has identified a vehicle um, uh, to, to manage uh, this um, investigative work that the council is, is putting in our direction uh, in a very able body, the Tauri Facilities Trust. Uh, and uh, it, it was chosen primarily because it already existed and it came with credibility. So having to start from scratch uh, wasn't, wasn't a, an issue. Maybe at this stage, I, in the submission, outlines the uh, progress that had been made since January up, in time, up until the time the submission was lodged. Um, and, and since that time, uh, the Trust has met and is considering um, expressions of interest uh, to populate the Trust Board itself and taking on board uh, the depth of um, interest that the community has shown. And I'd have to like also to, to point out that such is the interest that the local college, the Tory College, um, approached uh, myself um, to talk to the year 13 students uh, about doing a research pro project as part of the NCEA uh, uh, papers. 
uh, about a new Paula Mosque. And so here we have um, interest being shown by a younger group um, in trying to identify exactly what kind of pool uh, the area needs, who might use it and where it might go. Um, their work will be of much interest and I'm sure very informative. So in closing in that aspect of, my, of the board's submission is that I strongly urge you all um, to get fully behind this proposal and support it by agreeing to grant $30,000 to the uh, Tari Facilities Trust. In the second part of um, the submission about Rickenden Road, our submission is really all about the prioritisation of council staff work, schedules and timeline achievements. Um, they are at the basis of our submission and the board has called for staff updates. So the staff are looking into uh, the questions that we are raising. <coughs> but from earlier years, uh, planned deliberations um, quite an element of this project was indicated as being the funding and in particular funding uh, for quite a large portion of the, the project was to come from existing budgets. So the board really wants to be assured that those monies are there for this pro project to continue. Um, for that, I close my submission. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Stout. Thank you for your submission, Bill. Um, in here it's noted the $30,000 budget to go towards the Tauri um, Community Facilities Trust to get this pool project yep. back on the track. Um, I notice that we do have a submission saying that $30,000 isn't enough um, and that Council should be providing $50,000. Has the Community Board had that information and what's their position on it? No, the board hasn't uh, had that, and um, I must say that uh, reading this morning's OTT, I think it was, uh, it, there was a mention of a submission for additional funding. Um, sure. I can't talk about it because I have no knowledge about it. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you, Bill. Okay. I appreciate your submission. Thank you. Mr. Walker. Chalmers Community Board, welcome. Yep, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Nice to get you all early on while you're awake. Let's <laughs> see how you're doing later on because I'm here yeah, at <laughs> Thank you. I'm here at 4.50. Thank you. So you. Let's <laughs> see what's happening then. Okay, uh, thank you, obviously, for. Um, <clears throat> letting me speak on behalf of the Community Board and the members of uh, Dunedin's West Harbour. Um, I won't like, as I've done in previous years, just regurgitate what uh, is written in the submission. Um, it's obviously, uh, you're well versed in it via the uh, pre-annual, uh, sorry, the draft annual plan. And it was very good post that to see council working with the board to actually address some of the issues that have been raised. What I do want to do, however, is speak to three particular issues that came about as a result of a very successful um, annual plan roadshow that was held in Port Chalmers. <coughs> and the three issues that really came to the fore there were, um, as ever, the completion of the uh, cycle walkway to Port Chalmers, uh, the sycamore problem that is uh, rather pervasive in Dunedin's West Harbour, and surprisingly, the, the top issue was the um, the 30k speed limit in George Street, Port Chalmers. This may have been rather topical because it, we had the annual plan roadshow just as the speed limit trial was taken off. Um, so it was uh, obviously in people's minds and uh, it was certainly probably 100% of the residents who, who did speak to us were rather peeved. That, it, uh, that I guess they weren't aware of the trial period, they thought it was, it was going to be permanent, and they were all very supportive of the, the trial, and since, I've, well, since the board has put in the submission, we have had the report on the trial from Ron Minimum, which uh, uh, really did show that the, the speed trial worked, and the stats showed that um, under, the, uh, under the current 50k speed limit, 
the trucks have an average speed of 42.2 k's, and when the 30 k speed speed trial was on, that reduced significantly down to 30.6, and the overall average uh, speed came down from 44.2 to 33.2. So what it does show it's uh, it's very successful, and in this report. Uh, this, this speed trial is uh, very strongly backed up by the Port Chalmers Police and, of course, the Port Chalmers businesses. And I'm sure you've probably got other submissions uh, that uh, probably are in support of the speed trial. So, in the submission, we did suggest, obviously, that uh, you should consider, Council should consider perhaps looking at uh, bringing the trial back for next season. And, of course, that has cost implications. I think this trial cost, I think, around $6,000. So I guess the suggestion would be, would it be more logical to think along the lines of um, making it permanent rather than going through a bunch of trial periods that are just going to have cost implications. So that's something to consider. Um, obviously the um, completion of the walk, cycle walkway to Port Chalmers is something you've uh, certainly long-standing councillors have heard me talk about for many years and the board and the public. Um, I really do want to congratulate um, the Mayor and many councillors and staff in particular for the continued advocacy on this issue. And I, I personally feel, um, and I'd be you know, happy to hear your feedback, that for you know, after many, many years of trying, the ducks certainly are very much in a row. And I, I think uh, Dunedin, the West Harbour, and people who are going to visit here in the future can hopefully look forward to NZTA funding the 2015-18 round and take take what is currently a fantastic um, amenity all the way through the Port Chalmers. And the other issue that came up um, in the annual plan roadshow was the Sycamore problem. And again, I it's getting, getting too congratulatory here, but I congratulate um, council, some councillors, um, Andrew Chinti, and also staff. Um, we've had a sit down recently and it looks like we're thrashing out a, a forward plan to begin getting on top of the, the signal problem. So again, congratulations. And I just want to speak, as I always do, to item 7, which is the, um, about the cruise ships. And as I have said many times before, the $2,000 that is given to, to, the, um, to the Volunteer Visitors Information Centre Group, which is uh, run, it's probably a group of about 60 people who give up hundreds and thousands of hours each year to, um, to, to give their time and you know, uh, give a great welcome to the visitors that come to Dunedin. It's pro probably the best $2,000 that Council has ever spent and hopefully continues to spend. Um, so yeah, I'll close there, but obviously I'm well, you know, happy to field any questions you have. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Uh, first question is on the Aramwana Wharf, and yep. um, I'm not sure what progress has been made over the last year. I looked at it the other day from the other side of the harbour, and I'm just wondering whether it would assist to have time frames in place that we expect the work to be done in order to um, sh focus the funders, um, because what I think would be really terrible is to have made a decision last year that it goes on without any changes over the next few years. Uh, yep, I agree, and um, it might be pertinent, maybe, perhaps, to, uh, to ask Councillor Noon on, on the progress. Uh, Councillor Wilson will be pleased to hear that the hold-up is, is Council. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you were please, referring, you referred to the report that came past Council last year, so that report is still lying on the table. Mm -hmm. So what the Aramwina League, who is the community group who will drive this project, um, want is that that, that uh, report is uplifted. Council make a commitment to uh, maintaining any enhanced wharf, i.e. the store and um, what, what's there. Um, and uh, so if Council can make that commitment that an upgraded wharf will become an asset um, ongoing and that the city will maintain it. So that's the key uh, decision that this Council needs to make to trigger the community group that will find the funding, make the project work. Okay, thank you. Um, and second question, if that's right, Your Worship. Um, could I ask staff to have prepared for next week? The cost is on how much it costs to have speed restrictions in Dunedin for their cruise ships, because I think it's really unfair that we're looking at 5,800 here in isolation, albeit re recognising it's a NZTA road, but we don't have an understanding of what it costs in the George Street and the Octagon for tra um, traffic management, because um, I think they both 
have effects. Can I just clarify? So you asked me what, what is the cost of the of the comparable restrictions that we have in the in the city well, centre? Well, we, we've got the city centre temporary traffic yeah. control for cruise ships, um, and at the moment we're only looking. Um, there's criticism that it's cost five thousand eight hundred for George Street and Port Chalmers. How much does it actually cost in Dunedin? In, in comparison, uh, Councillor McTash. Thank you. I, I think. Kate's touched on it. I, I guess when I was reading your submission, Steve, I just thought, why are they advocating for another trial? Why aren't they asking? And the, the response from staff seems to indicate that the ball is very much in NZTA's court around it. What signals are you getting from NZTA in terms of their willingness to formalise the, um, the trial as a permanent feature? Um, NZTA themselves... Um I don't think we've had the conversation because it has gone through Ron, although I know they were obviously happy to um, support the trial, and the trial was very dependent on, there was one objection from um, from the CEO at Port Otago, who is now very much on board with it, we've sat down with him a number of times, so they're more than happy to, if, if it was to be, to be formalised as a permanent uh, speech, they're very happy, so I, I'd imagine the best guess would be that they'd be supportive of it. Councillor Vanders. Um, you mentioned the uh, Sycamore issue. Yeah. Um, I, I previously suggested that uh, the wonderful thing about sycamores is that when you cut them green, they are immediately good firewood. Mm -hmm. uh, and quite rare in that respect. You don't have to find the stuff to have it burn well. Mm -hmm. Do you see any potential for a community firewood project where um, uh, rather than just letting individuals go and help themselves, which I believe raise, raises some safety issues with, yep. with staff. Do you see any potential for, for organising, that is to say you or, or the community board, organising a community firewood project where uh, groups of people interested in accessing a lot of good firewood yep. could simply go in and clean up the sycamore problem? Yes, yes we do, and that's certainly part of the discussion. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a sit down yesterday with uh, Lisa Wheeler, and uh, councillors uh, Noon and McTavish uh, were there. And what is, going, what is going to happen for the new financial year is going to be a, a, a plan put in place, uh, pretty much based on location, agencies involved, because unfortunately in the West Harbour, it, we're talking about uh, on track, NZTA, private land, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so, for example, if a tree's that size, who can, who can go and deal to it? Can the public do it? Um, does an agency need to do it? Is it next to a road? So those, the, in, in essence, there'll be a, a formulaic approach to how one can deal with the trees, and certainly part of that is because uh, there's a new system now called uh, basal bark spraying, which doesn't involve poisons. Um, what happens is you basically put diesel around the tree, it dies, and as they die, <coughs> The suggestion is that would be a good, as they're dying or about dead, they'd come in and remove, um, remove the trees for firewood. So there'll be conversations with the local lions and Rotary, um, and obviously people like the golf club and other groups um, who have traditionally taken, taken trees when cows want to remove them in their area. So, so absolutely yes. Um, but more importantly, I'm really, you know, it's, it's after many years of, of, of knocking on the door, I'm very glad to see that finally a system may be put in place to address what is going to be a phenomenally difficult problem to, to overcome. So you do see yourself as empowered as a community to actually address this issue yourselves and the, the impediments from the DCC are, are not your major problem at the moment? West Harbour is tremendously empowered. Wonderful. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> the, the, yeah. the other uh, issue that I, I had to raise was the, um, you, you talk about the, the seed, the, the uh, cycle way. Um, the, uh, I read with some concern that there is a proposal to spend millions of dollars to move the railway line further into the sea to create room for a short section of cycle way. Mm -hmm. um, to me this looks A, unaffordable, B, very long term because of the time required for the settling mm -hmm. of the uh, new railway line mm -hmm. position. Do you see any other option for that short section of cycleway in terms of being able to facilitate the cycleway without having to move the railway line? Um, have, have you looked at options for that? 
Um, yes, the, 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 there's always other options, uh, Councillor Vendivus, but I think in, uh, if you look internationally, one of the biggest problems that non-successful cycle paths have is lack of continuity. So I think by breaking the continuity of the proposal would certainly be a great disincentive to people using it, which ultimately defeats the purpose, perhaps, of, of having it. I would agree entirely that you have to have that continuity. My question is, do you have to move a railway line to achieve that continuity? Given that there are potentially millions to be spent, would it not be cheaper to create a custom wonderful architectural tube flyover to, to, have, to have the cyclist go through. It'll can still I point, be cheaper than moving point the out, Can I point out here that it won't be the community board that designs it, <laughs> given that, you uh, know, I appreciate the question, but that it will be um, on track or um, NZR, NZT, NZT, whomever, yeah. will be taking responsibility yeah. for that anyway. So I, I suggest that those conversations we, we would need to have with them. Yeah, right that, there. That's what worries me, and, and uh, if NZTA are, are, are designing it, I think... No, not NZTA. It, it could be a combination of NZTA and, and uh, Kiwi Rail on track because they own the land. Yeah, that was my worry, and which is why I was asking uh, that perhaps the community board may be able to come up with some imaginative alternative uh, given that there is uh, the potential to spend an awful yeah. lot of money to actually bridge that gap. Yeah. In a perfect world, I absolutely agree with you, uh, Councillor Vandervis, but you know, I, I certainly can't, I can't think of any of us who are, who are structural engineers but, um, on the board. But you know, I, I think it's a great, a, a great suggestion. And I, I believe you know, alternatives perhaps can be looked at. But I th I th my feeling is that NZTA are, are fairly, fairly committed to, to forwarding this project. Thank you. Councillor Noon. Thank you, Worship. I hate having to ask a question that I know the answer, but I think it's like, I'm doing this best kind. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for your you approval. <laughs> With regards to the $6,000 that you, that you told us, Steve, that was the cost associated with the 30k traffic management plan, yeah. are you able to share with us whether the board contributed to that and how much? Uh, the board... Um, I might have to uh, call on your memory here, uh, Councillor Noon, but with the board either <laughs> the, board, the, board, the, board, the board either contributed nothing or it was a, a nominal amount. It was somewhere between eight hundred and thousand dollars off top. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know either. Um, I don't think it was that much actually. Okay, we can sort that out later. <laughs> Point I was making asking whether the board contributed. The answer is yes, and the other question was around the uh, transportation operations reprioritised the work in the, uh, the ward area to be able to gain the funding to do this traffic management plan, is that correct? Correct. Thank you. Yep. Those are the questions. Thank you, Steve. Just as I was beginning to have fun. Yes. <laughs> well, we have, we have a lot more fun to get through on yep. the front. I'll see you at 4.50, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Fenwick. Thank you. Welcome, David. Good uh, morning, uh, Council. Thank you for the opportunity to come along and speak to my submission. It's very brief. Um, uh, background really is that I'm a cyclist and I use the road from basically Howard through to Dunedin to commute as many times as I can uh, during the working week. So, um, with the opportunity to bring forward the uh, improvements to the road between Glen Pallet and Vauxhall, I'd like to take the opportunity to support the bringing forward of the date of those measures. And I'm basing that basically on my uh, sense of safety when I'm cycling on that uh, route. And it mainly comes down to traffic density and speed of flow of traffic. So I think it would be a uh, good thing to have the continuity of the cycleway basically from um, Macanca Bay where it begins all the way through uh, to Vauxhall and continuing with the current cycleways that we've got here now. So um, I did take some samples of traffic just to back up my assertion that there were more cars to contend with uh, at the time when I was cycling in the areas that we're talking about. So uh, if I leave my own 
uh, near Harwood and proceed through to Kendrick Bay, say leaving at 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I'm likely to be passed by um, cars at the rate of about one every one minute and 20 seconds if I'm between Glen Fallock or where the cycle lane finishes and where the cycle lane begins again in Vauxhall, I'm actually going to pass my cars at a rate of every one every 20 seconds. So it's a fourfold increase. Now that's normal, you'd expect that. But interestingly, if I take a sample leaving five minutes later, uh, today, for example, I was passed by 40 cars in that stage two of the journey, uh, as compared to maybe 30 if I left at 7 o'clock. So just five minutes different. So I'm going to imagine, and I don't really tend to take by being excessively late to work, I might take more samples, but um, <laughs> you, you would imagine that there would be a lot more cars at that time. So I'm thinking, for my safety, yes, this would be a good move. Uh, for people in Canterbury Bay who often I see taking their bicycles to Vauxhall and continuing into town from there, it would be good for them. There might, there might be a whole heap more of those that would actually start cycling. Um, you have the opportunity to use that particular part of the road for the events that, are, that occur. Sometimes they require a lot of traffic management for um, those sort of triathlons and things. They have based out of Oxford or McKinney Bay. So again, it would require a lot less uh, traffic management to achieve all of that. Um, I haven't mentioned the trip home because I generally would ride over Pikeworth Road. Um, but believe you me, at around about 5 o'clock to 5.30, the traffic uh, density is, is high and the speeds are high. So people tend to get home uh, in that region and they um, really don't have too much notice by and large of uh, the fact that the cyclist is on the road. So um, there you go. I have the documents relating to the samples if anybody wants that. Otherwise, um, yeah, it's just a waste of a tree. So <laughs> there you go. Um, any questions about that? It may be odd that I'm living away at, uh, beyond Port of Bell, in fact, supporting improvements to roads in an area that's not exactly where I live, but uh, you've heard my submission. Thank you for that. Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you. You mentioned um, cars passing you as you cycle, and I don't want to preempt Councillor Wilson's uh, questions, but um, I'm assuming that your commute uh, up and down Portobello Road, or at least one way along Portobello Road, included the time when the road widening works were happening that already exist. Um, can, can you... No? Uh, the, the samples that I took are only in areas where um, there are, are not really uh, where there are no cycle lanes. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I understand. I just wanted to know if you could um, talk briefly about the impact that when the when the work was happening, that it ha that has happened already, the impact of those works on your safety or perception of safety as you biked up and down at Portobello, Portobello Road. Oh, during the time that the works are occurring, yeah, yeah. generally down to a 30 kilometre speed limit, and um, it, it wasn't an encumbrance really to be experiencing that. Um, the only thing that you might find is that your tyres tend to be a bit more vulnerable for puncture if you've got uh, various things of grit on the road, but it really is only uh, minor. Um, but I take it you're talking about actual road works being a problem for cyclists and the amount of room that's going to be available for cyclists and motorists to share the road. And the increase in trucks that are around and those yes. things. Um, well, I suppose if you defer it, then it's going to be a problem down the tracks. Thanks. Councillor Wilson. Uh, the one suggestion I've had is that uh, it, appreciating if we could get NZTA funding um, to be in, to be over a shorter time frame or a different model, would um, you, as a rate power in that area, be averse to a targeted rate that may speed up the whole development? to um, this project so that we can possibly do more projects all at once? Um, I, I wouldn't mind personal, but um, I'm not sure how much support you'd get by and large from, from people who live in close proximity to me. 
Um, so I certainly uh, think we need to lose sight of that role. Okay. Um, there may be walkers on the other hand. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I, don't, I, don't, I can't speak for walkers. Um, the, and I, the, the little question of uh, Councillor Hawkins. Um, to my having gone down here the other day, if it's safe, if if we, as we, the, 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 there's something like I think seven hectares of um, land has to be rec reclaimed, or seven, and that's a lot of truck movements. And the question I put earlier today was, if you built that going out, then you at least safe. Um, there's a large number of truck movements required. Um, it, if you built it as you go out, at least you're making it safer for widening the road before the trucks have to get to that point. Does that make sense? Um, Was it considered? Yeah, yeah I, okay, so the road is, is generally going to be safer sooner for traffic going out. Well, well the, if, you, if you're putting a lot of trucks on there, you're better to minimise the truck hazard um, by building it going out so that it's wider as you go out. Right. And I'm just wondering, but do you notice as, as it was being built, the other sections, uh, more difficulty <coughs> with trucks? You may, it may not be the case, it, and it may not be a problem having trucks on that road. Uh, generally not, but the, the roadworks would not, there, there wouldn't be the presence of trucks when on cycling anyway. Okay. Um, so the only thing that you would be left with would be the uh, narrowing of the road for the various stages as they were um, mm. filling the camera and so forth. So, yeah, just the disruption to okay. normal traffic flows. Trucks will probably see them. Because you were there before them well, and after them? Yeah, but between, say, after 7.30 in the morning, I don't think they'll be starting. But they, they may do. I don't know. They're going to plan the job. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Noon. Thank you, Worship. The original decision on the staged upgrade was made back in, I think, 2005. So I'm just wondering, we, have you always lived at that current address prior to 2005, or were you yes. more of a recent? No, I've been there since 1995, 96. Okay, so you, so you, yeah, so you were there well before the discussions were had. So you were aware that that riding a cycle in and out to work three or four times a week was going to be potentially a bit of a challenge. Um, it probably from my weight perspective, but. Um, <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, no, it always looked hideously, hideously unsafe, and, and to, to most people it is still, and yeah, they won't use it. So. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Thank you, David. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Campbell. The okay, camera we'll resume, councillors. Um, Mr. Barker from Lana Pass. Welcome. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm Norcan Barker, Director of Lana Castle and just a bit of background with the castle. We're a multi-award winning attraction. We have about 100,000 visitors a year. We have a um, function centre, three types of accommodation and the main tourist attraction. We have 80 staff and we're an iconic landmark through New Zealand. We support the Heritage Buildings Option 3. We think what the city's doing with Heritage Buildings is amazing. I think. Um, they can take a real congratulations out of that. Also congratulate the funding towards the possum control on the peninsula. I think that's a wonderful initiative and hopefully the fauna and the bird life will benefit greatly from that in the future. Lana Castle has real concerns about the future of tourism. We feel tourism is not valued by the Dunedin City Council nor are the benefits understood. Part of this comes from the use of the Bill Report that stated tourism is only 6% of the GDP. The same report stated that tourism is only 21% of Queenstown economy um, and I think anyone that knows Queenstown would see this as unrealistic. I spoke to Graham Budd who's the CEO of Destination Queenstown and he said he would categorically state it's between 50 to 55 percent of their economy. Tourism is an export business that brings funds into our economy. It's not local or centrally government funded unlike the District Health Board of Education including the Varsity Police etc or the DCC these funds can be cut off at any time. It's expandable and it has huge potential. Tourism 2025, which is a T Tourism Industry Association and Tourism New Zealand plan, and I'll be interested how many councillors have actually heard of that. They want to expand the worth of tourism nationwide from 24 billion to 41 billion, so we, I think we should definitely need to be a part of that. 
We also think tourism inside the DCC is not appropriate. We think there's great conflicts of interest given the majority of stock in Dunedin is DCC involved. And it's interesting that these conflicts of interest is a reason that it was taken out in the first place for us with long memories and Dunedin Council has been in the tourism trade for close to 50 years now. We think the new entity will come under pressure to sell DCC products, especially when it comes to functions. Um, if you put a lot of money into new entities such as <coughs> the stadium, the Toy 2, they will be, could be put above us when it comes to trade shows such as meetings and they're asked where do you go, do you go to Lana Castle, where do you go to one of the DCC owned entities. The use of images, currently Tourism Dunedin uses a castle a lot on the images, the DCC don't really use us at all. So going in-house, we have great concerns about that. We have concerns about the governance in-house. Um, next point is I spoke to Kerry Brentagas, for those who know her, she was the Wellington Mayor when they had the successfully, very successful Positively Wellington. She's the current Chair of Tourism New Zealand. She said it would be a very big mistake to take inside council. Who is the lead for tourism in our city now? There was 100% of the leader's job. And from our, our understanding is the mark, person coming in will be a marketing person and tourism is now a very small part of their scope. So purely by logic, tourism has to suffer in Dunedin. As a business, who do we go to to speak about tourism in the city? Who is then the Dunedin representative of tourism at trade shows, conferences? And it's also a very dynamic industry. We know we need almost instant decisions and involvements with trade shows, deals, and with having two events that I don't know if inside a bureaucratic organisation is the best place for that. We are also concerned about the lack of KPIs for the new entity. With the new entity, the advisory board, we haven't heard the setup of that. What are the powers of it? What is the KPIs of it? What is the governance of it? The next point we would like to speak to is the not charging of the DCC entities such as Toy 2, Museum, Art Gallery. And that is killing us as a business. We think it's empty business. An example is the cruise ships come into town they get off the ship, they go around on free entities, and they don't spend a cent in the and they get back on the ship. What is in that for us for Dunedin? Also in the trade, if something is free, the wholesalers won't package it. If they did, we were able to package something, we could easily tip the fact that Dunedin is a one night stay, it could be a two night stay. The benefits for retailers, restaurants, hotels would be huge. The more you charge, the more wholesalers will want to actually sell you. And I've heard all the reasons why you won't sell it, it's difficult to do, but I went to the library the other day and I'm a business person, I thought you already have the database there in the library, you already have the technology with the library, if you can use the library card, maybe with a photo ID. I agree with the point it should be free for people who pay for it, which is the Dunedin ratepayers, <coughs> but from people outside the city, they haven't contributed anything towards it, so why they get it for free? There's a lack of consistency, Moana Paul was charged for, Olsen is charged for, why isn't everything charged for? And it was interesting to see the first submission about Alveston and their budget for marketing is 21,000. At the castle, we spend that in about two weeks. Our marketing budget is hundreds of thousands. We have a full-time person, we have two part-time people. And the point being, we sell the city. We, because they can't visit Lana Castle without visiting the city. And our direct competition is Alveston. And they spend less than 10% of our budget. And council owned entities right in our business, on the business coattails. And with, with charge, and we think we should, the city should actually do what is best, not what is easiest. Because so Margaret Thatcher had quite a nice quote about socialism. She says, it's nice, but eventually you run out of other people's money. If I came to the DCC for, with a scenario that Lana Castle is about to spend $40 million of competitors' money and not open for free, you'd essentially think I was mad, but that's the business plan of that. And while it's like this, there'll be no outside investment. When was the last time anything like Real Journeys, THL and Otahu came to Dunedin? And why it's not a level playing field, they won't come to Dunedin. We need to get out of the dark ages. Or is the DCC so flush with money that we don't need to worry about this? The last point is if you don't pay for something, you don't value it. The main point is we'd like to see tourism money ring-fenced. We'd like that money spent for tourism, not for city marketing. And we'd like to see the skills, knowledge and experience of Dunedin, tourism Dunedin kept. We've already lost a lot of experience and we'd like to see if we can limit that damage. We'd like to see the review for the in-house entity take into account the industry and private business views. Because currently we don't feel valued 
and logistically it's quite difficult for Mana Cars to be shifted to another city. I'm sure any other city would welcome us with open arms. So any questions or comments please? Councillor Calvin. Two things. The first is you seem to be saying on the one hand that the just about to be not current arrangement about having tourism to Dunedin should not be changed and on the other hand the rest of what you've told us is all criticisms of what how we've got to the point we are <laughs> while we've had tourism to Dunedin. Is that that you think that tourism to Dunedin has been doing a good job or that it hasn't been doing a good job? And the second part of that question is which are the most important KPIs that you'd like to see continue with the new arrangement? I think tourism and Dunedin were doing a good job from an industry point of view in very difficult times with the credit crunch, uh, the gateway to the South Island being the pressure share port, it was very difficult times and I think Alderston referred to that as a submission and so they were doing a good job. The second point, um, the KPIs I'd like to see is the yield is raised from tourists which flows on to if we don't charge tourists we're not going to get a good yield from them and also if we can increase the length of stay which again if we charge the wholesalers will sell us and the length of stay will increase. Councillor Bizet. Uh, Norcom, I support your comments about tourism in Denise and I have some sympathy for the comments you made there. But you also say well, we do have a feeling that the council does not value tourism or see the benefits it provides. Do you really believe that? Uh, this came from a talk that Mayor Cullen Councillor Staines gave at Dunedin Host and it was that it's only 6% of the economy and we need to prove ourselves. Whereas I would have said to Tourism is valued. How can we support you? Councillor Thompson. The, you, you, your supposition is that the fact that you have competitors who are free is damaging your, your, your business. To what extent, if those competing free businesses were charging, would there be a financial choice being ha having to be made by visitors to the city over where they spent their money as opposed to a time choice as to where they visit? I mean, if I can clarify that, if, um, if, if, uh, if you've only got one day and you can go to Toitu in the morning and the museum in the afternoon and it's free and then you're off you might argue that's compete that's damaging your business but if you've got if you've got more time but you're having to pay for everything then you're going to also self-select aren't you in terms of how much you can afford to spend so to what extent if if people are having to spend money on other things that they currently don't have to might that also impact upon your business it's an unknown, to be honest. Um, most cities do charge for everything, and people still go to those cities. I mean, the cruise ships are always here for a limited time, so they will, by default, take the cheapest options. Especially the current cruise ships, because they are lower economic cruise ships. They're not the first ones that came in that were full of rich Americans. These are full of budget Australians. Councillor Stones. Look, um, you've made the comment that we would be losing skill set. Are you aware that the new structure has staffing that are specifically uh, there for tourism? All I know is the leader of Tourism's Need, and I understand, is he not staying, or is he? I'm not sure at this stage what, what final decision has been made, but I know that there was no direct intention to lose skill sets. Uh, in the change and that there is a specific tourism sector plan so there will be tourism, funny, tourism, um, education, education, business and business. Destination. So we had uh, Dr Bidrow speak to Dunedin House last week and she was saying that the tourism will report to one person who is a marketing person. Is that, that was our understanding? Uh, I don't think that structure has been finalised yet that we work through with the new uh, director of the Enterprise Dunedin, um, with the focus on, or the focus on uh, is tourism, as I said. Okay, 
it's known as tourism, education, business uh, in the city. So there hasn't been a decision that they're aware of around the structure. Because our concern is we do a lot of interaction with tourism and then we used to talk to them every couple of weeks, we see a lot of them. If someone comes in and they are in charge of city marketing, tourism is a very small part of that. Who do we talk to within the DCC? Just one correction. Um, I did not say it's only 6% GDP and therefore you needed to prove yourselves. What I was trying to point out at that time was that we put some $1.8 $2 million into tourism for 6% GDP and we put about 400,000 now into all of the other industry that generates the 94% of our GDP. So it's just that question around are we getting the best bang for our bucks across the whole spectrum. I understand that, but that's, that's, like that. that's statistics and 6%, you know, if it's only 21% of Queenstown economy. I'd well, can I, can I challenge you on that? If you don't believe the 6%, what, what evidence? The question is, where's the evidence <coughs> that it's more than that? Have you, have you got that, or have you just got anecdote? Well, do you believe that Queenstown is only 21%? I don't know. I, I'm not an expert in analysis. I'm asking you if you've brought a substantiated analysis to show what percentage. We're not talking about Queenstown, we're talking about here. We can, go on, we can only go on the analysis we've done, and, I'll be, and if it's more than 6%, I'd, I'd be delighted I'm to know. In the, um, that the bill report is what we're going off, and it's statistics, so it's really for the methodology behind it is. And that methodology says 6% for the and 21% for Queenstown. So I'm using that as a direct comparison. I'm saying I'm sure that Queensland economy, if you pull tourism out, it wouldn't shrink by 21%, it would collapse overnight. Well, I don't know, but what I'm asking you is have you had any analysis done to show that tourism is a bigger proportion of the Dunedin economy than 6%? No. Thank you. Um, Councillor McTavish. Thank you. Norcom, I'm just interested in the comment that you made around most other cities charging. Um, we recently had a report on that very issue because we were considering um, charging visitors as per your recommendation or as per your suggestion. Um, the feedback that we had through that report was that um, most other cities around you, there is no precedent really for charging for access to art galleries and museums, that, that most other places don't have a charge on those. Um, so I'm just curious as to where that, where that comment came from. We, my mother and I, went on a trip through England and we were in all the attractions in England and the majority do charge over there. So I'm looking at it from an international point of view rather than a... Councillor Hawkins. Is it your contention that all non-residential, all people in Dunedin at any given time who aren't residents are therefore tourists? and should as such be charged to use the services here rather than a broader spectrum of reasons why people would come to be in Dunedin for business, visiting family, funerals, those sorts of things. It's got to be workable, so I would say anyone that isn't a resident would have to pay because otherwise it's just too difficult and if someone hasn't paid for it they shouldn't get it for free. But you do accept that not all people in Dunedin who aren't residents at any given time aren't Tourists. Yeah, there's no perfect solution. I do accept that. Any further questions? Thank you, Norman. Thank you. Thanks for your submission. <coughs> Mr. Anderson. <coughs> Ms. Tucker. Keep the need and beautiful. She was here. Yeah. Welcome, Jane. Right, you're representing Keep Dunedin Beautiful. Keep Dunedin Beautiful. I'm sure most of you here do know of the good work that we do around the city to keep our New Zealand beautiful, to keep New Zealand beautiful, and to keep Dunedin beautiful. <coughs> we would like to thank you for the past support of the two projects below, the hanging baskets and the murals. Hanging baskets probably the best ever this year. Um, but we will be looking for a new partnership if the funding is available. And we could look at relocation of some of the baskets. However, there is a problem with that. 
because about 15 years ago we raised it, the KGB raised a lot of money to put in the permanent watering system and if you haven't got that, those baskets don't do very well. So it's something that we will look at, but we are hoping that we will be continue to uh, receive funding for that. Graffiti. This is a, a increasing problem around, not, not only Dunedin, but in the suburbs, out in the, out in the suburbs as well. Um, we're pleased that there, the City Council um, has, like Rebecca Williams, Adrian Blair, met with Sue Bedros to discuss the problem. And we really believe that graffiti on council property should be removed within 24 hours. This sets an example for the private property owners as well. I don't know whether um, City Council is aware that the Ministry of Justice has quite a large amount of funding for graffiti. Several councils around in New Zealand have applied to it. One council's got 47,000 for setting up a project in education. Others are as low as 5,000 or whatever. But we believe if we want to be serious about keeping our town city free from graffiti, we need to um, get a policy and we would be happy to be the lead agency. We've probably had more experience at graffiti than anyone else around here, but we would also need to, to implement that. We'd need an adequate budget and hours to carry them out efficiently. Now, Darlene, our coordinator, receives most of the graffiti phone calls that come through, and she spends an inordinate amount of time on this. I don't think you realise how much time. Um, city street cleaning. This is something else that um, we get a lot of calls about. Um, that we believe there is a need for more street cleaners. We have a wonderful street cleaner that does the CBD and he, work, he does tremendous work, but there's an increase in litter and there's an increase in broken glass. And um, it's a continual dangerous. Now we do our bit, we have volunteers that adopt the spot. They are volunteers completely, we give them bags and gloves and they look after a certain spot they've adopted. And we recognised a lot of those at our um, awards. So, yeah, we are doing our bit for that. We also run a theatre group, a professional theatre group every year. So far this year, we have funding to the tune of 17,000 towards it, which means it is available to schools free. Last year, we went to, I think, around 50 schools. So we are doing an our bit with education on this, and um, we're not even asking for money for the council to do it, which is nice. Um, but we do what we do think is that we need two or more street cleaners and some of them to get out to the suburbs, to Green Island, to South Dunedin, Port, places like that, Mosgiel, where there is a problem and it could be addressed to make the place more beautiful. Uh, one of our other concerns, and we get quite a lot of phone calls about this and I've actually seen it, we have the um, motor mower people that ride on their little mowers and do the reserves and the areas on the street. What they do half the time is just drive over the litter so where you've got one bit of paper, you now have got bits. And sometimes the same with the bottles. And we have had people ring up and say, oh, well look, they stopped and picked up the bottle and then threw it back where they were mowed. I believe there needs to be more um, accountability. I don't think it's ever checked. People don't, I mean, it's only we get the complaints, so we do know that, just something to note. I know this it really annoys a lot of people, and I think it annoys me, Carl. The orange road cones and traffic signs around the city, especially in the octagon. And we know there's got to be safety there, but on cruise ship days, it's, it's just one maze of orange cones. Is it possible to move the cruise ship buses? Perhaps um, look along um, Cumberland Street outside Countdown. There's a big, huge bus stop there and a few parks. You'd get them off the main street. You'd get them out of the octagon. But in general, I think we're overpopulated with orange cones and road signs, not only in cruise ship seasons, but, you know, all round. And that's me. Thank you. Councillor Wills. Uh, Jan, thank you for your thoughts. It's always good. The city cleaning. Um, one of the issues there, and I'm just wondering, you, you may have seen the reply which said that the certain parts are done daily, some parts mm. are done weekly, two weekly and eight, every eight weeks. Now, one of the perception problems, I think, is that we probably don't tell people that the streets are being cleaned and when, and therefore either they're not prepared to, and they haven't moved their cars out of the way. So you're talking, yeah, sorry, you're talking about the street sweepers. We're talking a lot more about the pavements and areas like that. Okay. And I might say the street sweeper was in Port Chalmers three weeks ago. He swept the little leaves into little piles, went away, and it rained. So all the little piles then got immediately spread back to where they'd come from. 
Thank you. We have a street cleaner that goes to port with a blower and blows the rubbish up the road. Half of it disappears off that way and half disappears that way and a little bit comes there. It's with a blower. It's useless. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Thank you. Um, and thanks to Keep It and Union Beautiful for providing one of the few opportunities for paid acting work in Dunedin over all these years. I know many people personally are very grateful for that. I've got a couple of questions with regards to your submission. Um, the issues that you refer to with the Malcam Trust, and mm -hmm. I don't necessarily need to know what they are specifically if you're not comfortable talking about them, but are you confident that those issues won't transfer to future partners in that work? We would uh, be looking to make sure that we were covered. Um, we dealt with Blueskin Nurseries and with through Mark Brown, who did a one and his apprentice did a wonderful job. But it just did not work with Malcolm Trust. Um, they ended up with Blueskin doing most of the work. So we would be looking at other partners for that, using still using Blueskin <coughs> Nurseries probably. And around murals, um, I'm sure you're aware there are a growing number of uh, world class. Uh, street art projects going on around Dunedin at the moment. I wonder if that is something that uh, Keep Dunedin Beautiful would be um, interested in supporting, given that anecdotally at least um, the provision of art in public places in that form is uh, a, a vast deterrent to uh, tagging, which is what I'm assuming you're referring to when you talk about graffiti. Mm -hmm. um, we all, well, well, we do. I mean, the typical example was Baldwin Street, which we have done. We've done a huge number of murals. I don't know if you're really aware of the number we have done over the years. Um, George Street Underpass is another one we did this year. Um, we, 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 we just do, we, like, we've just done so many. Um, and we also do the bus shelters. Um, we get very good comments on the bus shelters. One at Burke's has just been finished. It's looking great. We're nearly finished. So, no, we do the murals where areas are pointed out to us that's tagging, and Baldwin Street was one. So you haven't had issues, so that where you have uh, murals, there haven't been issues subsequently with... No, well also we areas. cover them with anti-graffiti paint. Right. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you, Jan. Okay. Much appreciated. Mr. Dowson. <coughs> Welcome, Phil. Thank you very much. You're uh, representing the Otago Settlers Association. Indeed. Um, sort of a, a brief um, copy of what I'm going to say. And uh, we please know it's almost all positive. That makes it a lot easier for me, and hopefully for you too. So, um, as we all know, the, the city's new museum continues to receive accolades from all quarters, and it's a comfortable and energetic space in which to spend quality time. The Otago Settlers Association is very proud to be associated with Toy 2 Otago Settlers Museum and uh, to have made meaningful contributions to the fundraising. I've previously submitted in support of the aspirational target of 180 visitors to the museum a year. Little do we think that that number will be exceeded within the first six months of the museum opening without any indication of it tapering off to any marked degree. The museum has now established itself as a destination for social history, community events, local gatherings, or just a good cup of coffee. Nevertheless, the job's not finished. It's essential that the museum is, continues to be well managed with good resources so the citizens of Dunedin and our visitors continue to regard it as the place to go. Operational funding must reflect world-class museum, the world-class museum that's been established. Of course, the museum staff now have an additional challenge with the Chinese garden being added to their responsibilities. The association fully supports this reorganization as there is potential for real synergy and improved visitor experience in the historic precinct of the city. The association continues to be very impressed with the museum staff. They are an energetic group who, continue, who are continually looking for ways to maintain the museum operating at current world best practice. There is a true visitor focus balanced with an imperative to treasure the collection for future generations. 
It was welcome news that the dedicated position of museum director will be advertised soon. It is a big job. And best value will accrue if that person can focus on the museum and the Chinese garden with authority to manage and enhance the museum, maintaining the high standard. It's pleasing to see that the director of the Otago Museum is continuing a regular dialogue with uh, Toyota Otago Settlers Museum with a view to collaboration rather than competition. Both museums are very strong in their collections and main areas of interest. There is so much scope, it should never be necessary for ex exhibitions and programs to overlap. There are opportunities, however, for complementary exhibitions and programs coordinated to give visitors a wider appreciation of the subject. This approach will enhance the concept of Deneen having a museum cluster and as a destination for history and heritage. There are a couple of points that I'd like to submit on further. And one is, is the importance of the annual acquisitions budget, being able to respond quickly to opportunities to uh, purchase important collection items. I know that the, uh, the part of the budget in which that sit was changed, but it's, it, the museum staff are identifying gaps in the collection and will need to call upon that budget uh, from time to time, and they need to be able to, um, to act quickly in some cases if a particular item is coming up for auction. Um, signaling here that future funding may be requested to strengthen the promotion of the museum cluster in order to increase visitor numbers to Dunedin. And future funding may be requested to provide further professional advice and support for the smaller museums in the cluster. I know that already happens, that need may increase in the future. So thank you again for uh, receiving our submission. I'm happy to answer any questions. Councillor Carroll. We've, we've heard this morning from Larnox Castle that they consider Dunedin City to be a bit of an unfair competitor to them, especially because it chooses not to charge for its activities compared with um, other ones. <coughs> Would you have your comment to make about whether any of the, in particular, Toy 2 could move to a charging model or, in another sense, another way of achieving some of what Larnock Castle might want would be to, if we're heading down the potential for museum cluster activities, could heritage and things be a cluster that isn't just council with its unfair position, for want of a better description? Could it include other private, um, historic and, and collected items? <laughs> Mr Chair, that, that's quite a, a wide question, of course. Uh, I think everyone will remember that uh, it used, there used to be charges to uh, um, enter the Otago Settlers Museum, and that was one of the benefits that the Otago Settlers Association can offer its members. Um, the council decided that it no longer wished to charge to be more in line with the Otago Museum and, and the Art Gallery. And, um, and I have to say, we did support that because we thought it was fair that there was a large portion of public good in making the collection available to, um, to the wider public. And in terms of the museum being a place for people just to cruise and visit for half an hour and come back again in a, next week for another half hour, it seems to me that the museum not charging is entirely appropriate. Taking that further, um, I th I'm not sure that we can group all of the heritage and historic facilities in the city in, into the same category. And uh, certainly Lana Castle has some special, um, it's special in certain ways. And of course it is quite remote, so people are making a um, a decision to go there to visit the, uh, the, the castle, whereas people might just pop in to Toy to Otago Settlers Museum for, as I said before, for a short time. So I think it is quite different, and um, I'm very comfortable with leaving that decision with the council um, uh, following wider consultation and, and consideration. Further questions? Councillor Hall. Just two things. Um, your submission 
refers to, uh, this is on page, uh, page 102, group of activities, it's 97 in our, our script. Um, <coughs> furthermore, increased use of volunteers will enhance the community involvement and connection. Um, and Dunedin relies very heavily on volunteer labour in a lot of instances, um, which is fantastic, but I do sometimes worry about being overly reliant on a volunteer workforce and I just want to seek reassurance that the work that those volunteers will be doing uh, isn't work that should in fact be paid work. Um, thank you Mr Chair, that's, um, that's a very good point and we are very aware that we wouldn't want volunteers to replace uh, paid jobs. There is more of an emphasis on members of the association simply assisting with events rather than being uh, volunteers and replacing uh, what might otherwise be a full or part-time job. Uh, we have a lot of members who are very keen to get more involved with the museum uh, behind the scenes and with visitors and we would like to encourage that and we're working with the, uh, the acting director to, to allow that to happen. But um, Mr. Chair, I'd like to reassure you that we, we wouldn't want to um, be taking away potential for increased jobs. Um, in in a, a tight economic environment, obviously funding is short, and if we can support the museum in a, with people power, um, then we would, we would have to do that on a, a temporary and, and on the basis of assisting the existing staff rather than providing um, temporary employees. And secondly, the Otago Museum have submitted to us that the proposed increase in Toy 2 and Dunedin Public Art Gallery funding, uh, parts of which at least should be reallocated instead to fund Otago Museum, um, in the spirit of camaraderie, I'm sure. I, I wonder whether the Otago Settlers Association has a particular view on that suggestion. Um, again, I think I must defer to, to, to the Council to, uh, to make that call. Uh, um, the budget for the museum is pretty tight. It, it can't afford all the staff it would ideally like. I, mean, I know it's always the case. I would, I would be surprised if there was significant further savings in the operation of Point to Otago Settlers Museum, which could be reallocated to, uh, to the Otago Museum. But um, I don't have the detail to even start to suggest where any savings might start. Thank you for your diplomacy. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Bazir. Yes, well, in regard to um, your statement with to, pertaining to the museum cluster and looking at um, further, possible further funds to develop that, uh, do you see the Sports Hall of Fame and museum in, in, in that cluster? I would think so, certainly. Um, I certainly see um, the art gallery, the collection at the public library. Um, um, Obviously, the Hocken um, National Archives all being part of that. So I would think the Sports Hall of Fame would be an important part. Mm. No further questions? Thank you, Phil. Thank you. I appreciate your submission. And it's very positive nature. Mr. Chisholm. Welcome, Bill. You're well, um, representing Football South. <coughs> so, the next ten minutes is yours. Great. <coughs> I'll get on with it. Um, I'm getting a, my, uh, my submission with a few extra documents sent round. Should be enough for one each. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Bill Chisholm, General Manager... Football South. Football South is one of the seven federations of New Zealand football. So I represent some 9,000 members in our federation, approximately half of those in Dunedin. Uh, there are two, one or two ideas I would like to share with you this morning. Firstly, it's our vision for a home of football. Uh, I've been here before talking about it and um, we'll keep on about it. Um, it's incorporating our an artificial turf as part of the Logan Park redevelopment plan 
that was uh, shelved a few years ago with the building of the stadium. Um, the possibility of accessing FIFA funding for this has certainly been enhanced by the city hosting the Under-20 World Cup Finals next year. We hope that the home of football will be part of the legacy from that tournament. The home of football concept is part of a strategic plan to grow the game and provide pathways for people of all ages and abilities. To that end, we want to build partnerships at a local level with the council, Sport Otago, schools and clubs, tertiary education providers and the business community. Football is part of the sport and recreation sector, which contributes significantly to both the economic and social development. As such, we'd like to see more recognition of this in economic development planning. It is encouraging to read about the forming of the new Enterprise Dunedin Agency, incorporating econo the Economic Development Unit, Eyesight and Tourism Dunedin. Hopefully this inspires a more integrated approach to economic development. I'm also encouraged by the developing sister city relationship with Shanghai and the opportunities that should bring to both football and sport in general. I also want to share with you a vision for the stadium and how we should view sport in general. Ultimately, the stadium should be used 365 days a year for all kinds of activities, not just sport. It should be seen as social capital, an investment for the future for people to use and enjoy. With this in mind, we like, we like the community use fund that's already established for the stadium, and we've certainly made use of it ourselves in over the last year or so. We also like the refreshing and inclusive approach of the new CEO, Terry Davis, and we look forward to working with him in the future. So, as a city, we should be trying to answer the following questions. What is the real value to the community of the stadium? What is the real value to the community of Logan Park and the redevelopment plan? What is the real value to the community of our home of football? And, and, and the, the overall sort of arching question, the real value of sport and recreation. So I haven't really come here asking for a specific amount of money, but rather a change in mindset. How you view football, sport and the stadium. Uh, you'll see some extra supporting documents that I've included that might help you along with your thinking. And um, I'll maybe just finish with a, a quote from a Walter Fust, who was Director General of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Sport is not a luxury in our society. On the contrary, sport is an important investment in the present and the future. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Councillor Wills. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen the response from staff. Um, yep. who, have, you, have you seen that? They suggest one that you need to do the feasibility study. But the question I've actually got is for staff, if anyone can answer it, is whether um, they've also suggested that measures um, that, that to measure the imp economic impact of um, sports provisions is something they'd like to do when there are competitions in town. I'm wondering whether that is resourced now, why we're not doing it now, or whether we need to have more resources in order to do it. Well, I, I, yeah. it's a valid question, but I don't, yeah. it's not one that we need to answer right at the moment. But, but we, before next week, if we could get that information. Yeah. Okay. Um, Councillor Vance. Um, thank you very much for a variety of uh, interesting comments and uh, particularly for a, a stadium vision that gets used constantly 365 days a year I think you, you suggested. Yeah, maybe um, a couple of days off for public holidays probably. Do, uh, do you realise that the turf that's in there despite the reinforcement that it's got uh, especially in the winter takes a good two weeks to recover from just one game? Yeah. To get it to be used for 365 days a year, then, do you 
recognise that an artificial turf is needed, or, or do you have some other ideas yeah. for being able to keep the existing turf set up and still get the kind of use that you're hoping for? Yeah, I, I think it's um, you've got to get away from thinking it's just the turf anyway. So there's there's plenty of space there for, um, like at the uh, ODT end of the ODT stand end of the stadium. There's quite a big flat surface there that can be used every day. It's a concrete pad. So that can be used by all sorts of... I think that's where the, um, one of the local markets is staged every Sunday. And obviously there's plenty of space up in the stands that should be used, being used um, for community groups and commercially as well. So it's not just the turf. There are limitations with the turf. And I guess maybe at some future date Maybe it will be artificial turf. Um, I guess the uh, whether international rugby can be played on that at the moment, but maybe in the future that, that would be possible. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Wilde. Bill, thanks for coming today. Um, is there any timeline on the FIFA funding for the artificial turf? Not officially, but the, the longer you leave it, of course, someone else jumps you in the queue. And um, there's already been, I think we're really the only major centre in, Dine in New Zealand that hasn't had FIFA assistance with funding up till now. But, you know, Auckland could jump ahead of us and they might want another one. So um, I, I think it's a, a real, a good opportunity with the World Cup this under-20 World Cup next year. We've already talked to the local organising committee about legacies, and that's our priority. You know, if we could access that funding, um, it puts us, you know, on the road to getting that home of football. And just a quick follow-up question. When you look at um, Saturday club soccer last year, how many weeks did you lose because of the fields? Last year was quite a good year, I think. Um, so probably only two or three yeah, it was a good year. Um, it's pretty wet at the moment, so we'll see what happens this year. Yeah. Councillor Thompson. The, I'm interested in what your perception is of the barriers to getting uh, what you want on Logan Park. Um, <coughs> if if the money's coming from FIFA, and, and, and if it's possible to set that aside and say, well, that's not a barrier, what is it that you see that is getting in the way of this proceeding um, that council could make a difference about that might not have a cost implication, for council anyway? I mean, as I understand it, the council has set, um, has set aside some land there for, for the artificial turf to be initiated. So, I mean, that's, it really finances the, <laughs> it all comes down to the finance. So even with the, the fee for money, we would still have to do a whole lot of fundraising. But at least we're sort of getting on for about halfway there. Um, at the moment, the total cost of something like that is probably 1.5 million. But I get, and, and also it's, uh, you know, that, that other point I'm trying to make, I guess, is looking at the sport and sports facilities. Um, I don't want to steal John Brimble's thunder, was from Sport Otago, but I'm sure he'll be talking about facilities plan and the impact that has on our community for the future. And, and so I think we need to be looking at these, um, this, this idea of social capital and the, um, it's sort of getting away from the, the old profit and loss idea. So the, the, main, the, main, uh, the main hurdle is the finance. Um, the counts, uh, as far as I understand it, are talks with Parks and Recreation, um, Hamish Black, um, Mick Reese, and so on. I think they are. I think they're generally behind it. So that's good. My recollection, is, though, is that one of the potential issues was that it, if FIFA were putting the money in, oh. it would need to be for the sole use of football. I think we need to be in control of it, yeah. Um, but it's not to say it's, it's solely used by football, but I think it's uh, with FIFA putting that money in, it does need to be a football-specific uh, turf rather than, say, a hockey turf, uh, which is different.
Yeah. Councillor McTavish. Two questions, um, Bill. Thanks for coming in. Um, firstly, the staff referred to the need for a feasibility study by Football South um, for a proposed home of football at Logan Park. Is that something that you guys are currently underway on, or is it um, is that the first time that you have heard about the need for a feasibility study? Um, I don't think it's the the first time we've had a need for it. If you go back to 2012. I think we produced a, a report for the council that sort of answered quite a few of the usage type questions. So, no, it's not new, but, you know, and there's plenty of evidence around the country from the different um, other councils um, that can support the, the benefits of an artificial turf and the 24-7 the type usage that that can provide. So it's not a problem, no. Yeah, okay. And in just in terms of following on from Councillor Thompson's question, when you say football would need to be in control of the turf, is that, you mean, is that, and then you gave the example of the type of turf, that's totally understandable, um, but does that need to be in control of the turf, extend to management of the turf on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, I think so. Right. Yeah. Would football then be um, paying rent effectively for that piece of ground, which would otherwise be used by council for That's other... good question. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I guess it's something for you guys to work out, and that's the idea behind um, you know, uh, budgets and, and all the rest of it. But, yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, if you're going to charge us the same amount as the stadium, probably it'd be a bit of a hurdle. Okay, thank you. Councillor Stanis. Can you just remind us um, of what level of funding uh, FIFA might be prepared to put into an artificial turf? Uh, 500,000 US. So, uh, the of a total of about one and a half million. Yep. Yep. So, at the moment, does um, Football South uh, have any funding of its own to add to that, or is it...? Well, we, uh, it, it would be this, the, the, um, uh, the focus of major fundraising that would have to be it. Uh, yeah. We don't have, you know, we don't have that money to put on ourselves at the moment, no. So in terms of what we've done with hockey in the past, which is to provide a loan yep. on which um, we have a, a low interest rate, um, but that has to be repaid. Is that something that uh, Football South may be interested in looking at? And, and is it worth perhaps considering uh, and giving us some information on whether that's a possibility and to what extent it might be a possibility? Because there is a, a liability involved in that. Yeah, no, I think that's the sort of thing we should be looking at. Um, our sort of uh, our equivalents, and I know that our equivalents in Wellington have just been doing that basically and so they have a, a substantial capital football have a substantial loan to the um, I think it's with the Wellington City Council so that sort of model is uh, there, there are different models around the country but that's certainly one that you we'd want to consider yeah it would be helpful I think yeah I think so understand from yep. football south just how they would see that and and what to what extent they could commit <coughs> Yep. Because that would then help us understand what financial exposure we have. Yeah, D yeah no, that's, um, that's uh, certainly be subject for ongoing discussions, I hope. Councillor Hawkins. The kind of artificial turf that you're proposing, this floodlit artificial turf for the home of football, um, and it's an interesting comparison, I think, to the, to the hockey turfs, what is the life span of it because there's need to my understanding need to be replaced every 10 years or something is this Pro it's probably about right um depending on the usage i guess but i guess somewhere between 10 and 15 years you sh you would be looking to um replace it yeah is your understanding that the fifa money would be a one-off for its initial construction and any further replacements that burden would fall on our community well, I think we can be running it on a sort of 
uh, at least a semi-commercial basis that, that we'd be, we would be sort of hiring it out to um, for uses by you know, s schools and clubs and some competitions as well. So uh, I think that's part of the model we set up is to try and um, uh, have a revenue stream so that you're, you know, after 10 years you've got enough set aside for um, sort of not only for ongoing maintenance but for replacement. The schools and clubs tend not to have a whole lot of spare cash either. No. Um, it's inevitable that uh, there will be some element, I'm assuming, of a user pays charges to use it once it is constructed. Yeah, that's, that, from, will, yeah, that's, that's what I meant before when I was talking about yeah. it. So will that not create barriers to access that don't necessarily currently exist given the infrastructure that is used present? Yeah, I mean, we, we, the, the, we do have in football quite a few user pay programs that, that are basically... Um, uh, but not the turf. Not the turf, no. But so we're we're not unused to paying um, a charge for some products or services. So I guess the, the again, if you go around the country, that's that's a pretty common model for uh, helping to uh, gain revenue to to look to the future and for replacement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. Thank you. Cheers.